Oh, good morning. Uh, my name is Paulo Sotero. I'm the director of the Brazil Institute here at the Wilson Center. Uh, I'm here uh, on behalf of Jeff Dabelko, the director of the Environmental Change and Security Program that has been a partner of USAID for uh, a number of years now, working together. Actually, the Brazil Institute also is now involved in work, uh, work uh, in doing work as partner of AID. Last year, we facilitated a series of consultations on environmental trends in Latin America and the Caribbean. The report is available at our website. Uh, this, we are here today uh, and uh, to discuss to a forum on social dimensions of RED, current practices and challenges, obviously a complex, difficult topic, uh, especially if you come from a country that has a lot of forest. Uh, and uh, I wanted to introduce uh, the person that will lead the conversation here, uh, Diane Russell. Bio biodiversity and social science uh, specialist on the biodiversity and forestry team within the Office of Natural Resource Management at USAID. Uh, Diane is an anthropologist who has worked in natural resource management for uh, the last 25 years within AID, uh, World Agroforestry Center, uh, World Wildlife Fund, and other institutions. Diane is currently activity manager for the social and environmental soundness component of the carbon of the forest carbon markets and community programs uh, that is hosting this open forum. Diane, the mic is yours. Thank you very much, Paolo, and thank you very much to the Woodrow Wilson Center and the Environmental Change and Security Program for hosting our day today. And welcome, everybody, to this exciting day. It's great to see colleagues, it's great to see old friends, as well as new faces coming together to discuss this fascinating topic of social dimensions of Red Plus. It's a big crowd, and I think we'll, we'll have others coming. Um, it's going to be a busy day, but we hope that everyone gets a chance to participate and share their views and share the resources and the work that they're doing on uh, on Red Plus. Um, in any case, we really feel that this day is just a start. It's a start of a conversation with our partners and within the agencies on what should be a broad and deep conversation about the social dimensions of Red Plus. So I'm just going to make a few pr framing remarks at this point because we have a lot of um, experts and we have a lot of um, deep discussion that we're going to do in the afternoon. Um, I'm just going to talk about why we're here, um, very briefly on what is Red Plus because others will go into depth on that. Um, the U.S. government, USAID and Red Plus, uh, some of, uh, you know, point out that we have a Red Plus strategy and that we have ongoing programming. Um, talk a little bit about the Forest Carbon Markets and Communities Program, which is hosting this event, which is a, a USAID-funded program. And social and environmental soundness, what does that mean to us in FCMC, and what, what does it mean more broadly in the Red Plus arena? <laughs> Mention the Experts Workshop that we just held out at Airlie, Virginia, from uh, Sunday, October 16th through Wednesday the 19th, where we brought together 40 participants to sort of chew on these issues and come up with a series of action recommendation. And I hope you'll bear with us because we had one day to synthesize <laughs> all of these recommendations to present them to you today. So they're a little raw, but I think, I think our wonderful panelists did a great job of, of putting together some key points and key themes. Talk a little bit about some of the messages and, and that I think are really relevant to USAID as an agency and then uh, very briefly go into what we hope to achieve today. So why, why are we here? 
we know that adaptation efforts um, kind of have a clear social need. They meet a clear social need. They have a social face. But mitigation, mitigation has been conceived of and, you know, the message around mitigation, it is a technical. It's about carbon. It's about sequestration. Uh, the social impacts and benefits are unclear. And they've also been debated and discussed in a lot of different fora. You know, what does it mean for local people? What, you know, what, is, what are these you know, instruments and mechanisms like Red Plus? What are the impact, social impacts going to be? Well, the message is we, we do care about the impacts of climate change on people, including the impacts of policies and mechanisms designed to mitigate climate change. We want to increase the positive social impacts and avoid the negative impacts of mitigation efforts. And there's been an upswing in attention to the social dimensions of Red Plus. It's time to take stock and to consider new steps. This is why we had uh, we, the workshop uh, this week. For example, at the international level, there are guidelines within the Forest Carbon Partnership Facility and UN Red, social guidelines. At the national level, many actors are working through uh, the Red Social and Environmental Safeguards process. And at the project level, um, the Climate Community and Biodiversity Alliance that Joanna Durbin is going to talk about later this afternoon are working through standards related to the, uh, social, uh, social monitoring. So there are many initiatives going on, which is why we need to, you know, bring these all together in a comprehensive picture. So I, I, I'm preaching, I mean, you all know what RED is and what RED Plus is. I actually, RED, Red Plus was, um, I was wondering when I first heard the term RED Plus, I thought it had to do with social benefits, but the technical definition <laughs> really has to do with avoiding deforestation and increasing carbon sequestration in forests. So um, while there is, the social benefits aren't explicitly in the formal definition, there really is a recognition that the solutions are not just technical and um, the mechanism isn't just about uh, carbon, but other social dimensions have to be included. So we have a USG RED strategy. It's about a year old. I'm not going to go into it because our global climate change coordinator, Kit Batten, is going to be here with us, and she's going to talk a lot more and elaborate more on that strategy. But just to point out that there is um, within it a mandate for us to look at social and environmental safeguards um, in that strategy. USAID has an emerging portfolio in the Red Plus arena. The climate change team participates in delegations and Red Plus fora. There have been a number of training materials and communication materials developed. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the FCM FCMC program that is a global support program for Red Plus. There's a Silva Carbon uh, program that focuses more on the technical carbon monitoring. There's been, uh, uh, over the last year, uh, our partners at Tetra Tech ARD have done and the Property Rights and Resource Governance have done a series of case studies on carbon rights. In fact, they just had a readout, a workshop on that yesterday. So there's a, a new materials on, you know, what is this new property right of ca carbon and, you know, how are countries dealing with this property right and how can it be conceived? We have a program called TransLinks that's done a number of red case studies. We've supported the Katumba Group, which is uh, a forum for payments for ecosystem services. Uh, a lot of it has been devoted to looking at RED and not only uh, doing the forum, but also uh, helping local partners to understand what RED is. And then as, as we speak, uh, TransLinks is supporting the Land Tenure Center out in Wisconsin workshop on land tenure and forest carbon man uh, management, getting some key academics involved in looking at the interface between land tenure and forest carbon. There's a number of direct uh, mission programs, such as, uh, I, you know, USA, this is acronyms. So lowering emissions in Asia's forests, that's LEAF, Indonesia Forest and Climate Support, IFACS, BioRED, which is in Colombia, and MRED, which is in Mexico. So let's get to Forest Carbon Markets and Communities, which is hosting this uh, open forum today. It's a, it's a global support mechanism to assist missions, partner governments, and international stakeholders in developing and implementing integrated Red Plus initiatives. So it's about $14 million over three and a half years, implemented by Tetra Tech ARD, a contractor, with these other crit critically important and globally recognized players. So we're really 
pleased to have FCMC um, to, you know, help support our global red efforts. So what are we doing within this whole area of social and environmental soundness in FCMC? We call it social and environmental soundness because it, it's a comprehensive approach to addressing the social dimensions. Uh, it's not just about safeguards. We're looking at participation and engagement, social and, and environmental assessments, sa safeguards and standards, but the whole issue of you know, really bearing on social sustainability. How could we make RED more socially sustainable from a number of different angles? And to date, we've, within this SES component of FCMC, excuse the acronyms again, <laughs> we're, uh, and, and then here's another series of acronym soups. Um, we're supporting, we supported the launching of the Alliance for Global RED Capacity Building which uh, th that launch was held over at Conservation International. We've developed a training module for USAID on social and environmental soundness that we've rolled out a couple of times. There's been an integrated assessment, RED plus assessment in Peru, and there's one coming up in Ecuador. And we're, we've just started to support a new initiative called the Learning Initiative on Social Impact Assessment, or LISA RED. And we, ho we have commissioned a, a sort of study meta-analysis of social impact assessment methodologies for RED. So we've, we've, we've only been going a few months and I think we've already made some significant progress. Um, so at the, at, at the experts workshop out at Airly this week, we really wanted to identify some of the key social issues, again, from this broader perspective of, of social soundness. Um, who are the actors? What are the resources? What are they doing? What are the processes that they're interfacing with? We wanted to identify gaps and priorities for action, and we wanted to network people from a, a number of different arenas. We had people coming from every region of the world. We had NGOs. We had a number of USAID staff, including folks from missions. We had some key academics. We had people who interface very uh, strongly with the private sector, with government and with other donors. Um, we had people who work in civil, uh, work with civil society organizations and people who work directly on human rights and advocacy. So it was a very diverse group of about 40 people. And what are we gonna do with the findings from that? Well, some of it you'll hear today. We'll create a public report. We're going to be preparing and, and sort of massaging these materials for a side event in Durban that has been now elevated to the level of an embassy side event. So it will be actually going out to all the embassies in the world to help raise awareness of the social dimensions of RED. We'll be um, taking it on the road to the banks, to the foundations, and um, to USAID missions and gover governance, governments. And then we'll integrate the findings into our tools and training materials. So the overarching workshop th themes for th the experts workshop were how can social soundness processes, you know, things like social assessments and, um, sa and, and safeguards, contribute to RED outcomes in terms of efficiency and effectiveness, actually making RED work on the ground? Or do, you know, are there trade-offs between, you know, at paying attention to social processes and the efficiency of RED? So we, we tried to work through some of those thorny issues. And then how can RED sufficiently address equity outcomes, concerns about gender, and we, you're going to hear a lot, be hearing a lot about gender equity today, uh, about indigenous people, about other marginalized people, about their inclusion and participation and benefit sharing. And then what about even going further than that, enhanced governance, um, property rights, improved property rights, poverty reduction, is it, or is that too much to put a burden on this, on this mechanism? I just want to make a note that many were asking why we didn't explicitly focus on it, biodiversity environment benefits. We did, and you'll see in some of our findings the environment is clearly in there, but we wanted to focus in on the social because um, we felt that there was uh, you know, a need to synthesize and a need to really come up with some strong ideas for how to, um, uh, how to move forward on the social dimensions. So here's some key messages for USAID that came to me from this workshop. And I'm speaking, I'll just speak outside of my official capacity because um, these are not, I'm not saying USAID needs to do this or we, we absolutely will be doing this. I'm just saying these were the messages that came to me from the workshop. Experience matters. We have a huge amount of experience in USAID on, on community forestry, natural resource management, 
forest governance, legality, capacity building in forestry, forest-based livelihoods. It was clear from what the experts said that we can use this experience, not just USAID, but the global experience to bear on how to make RED more effective and to address equity concerns. We know how to do a lot of this. Um, we have the tools to provide leadership on gender and RED, and you'll be hearing from our Deputy Administrator Steinberg and, and Jeanette Garung on how we can really operationalize that. I think we could really take leadership. We can also, we also have the tools for mapping and working at a landscape scale, and we'll elaborate on that a little bit. USAID's been working at landscape scale conservation and natural resource management for 15 years, and we can bring to bear that experience on the RED process. We could also develop methodologies for social baselines and systems mapping. You know, we have some very good methodologies that we can, um, we can help governments and actors develop so that the social is, comes up to the level of the technical, um, the level of quality of the data and methodologies comes up to the level of the carbon accounting. We, we hope that the social uh, analysis could also come up to that level. We could also support uh, strategic research, such as how to build on these existing initiatives, um, how, how best can save, how, when do safeguards work and when do they, you know, when are they less effective. We could really try to understand more deeply in specific countries what works to reduce deforestation and how can we build on the knowledge of what works. And because we, we're now putting a big emphasis on research in s and and USAID, I think that would be very appropriate. So today, what are we gonna do today? Um, we're gonna learn about the importance of gender and women's empowerment to USAID. We're gonna learn from, from Deputy Administrator, Stein, Administrator Steinberg and from Jeanette, and we're gonna be discussing this. We're gonna learn about USAID's climate change program and specifically about our work in Red Plus. More from Kit Batten, who's our global climate change coordinator. We're gonna get an overview of the experts workshop out outputs. We have um, three wonderful participants who have who volunteered and worked very, very hard to present some presentations. And again, they're presenting, this is their own thoughts, it doesn't represent the view, the official views of USAID, but it's something we all worked on together and we think, you know, make some very compelling points about what we did over the last three days. I have a chance to pose questions, discuss key issues, resources, processes and where are the gaps, you know, what are the action items, where can we move ahead. In the afternoon we're going to break into groups and we're going to try to really have people think about how we can operationalize and move forward and, you know, identify new areas of research, new, you know, new areas of intervention that, you know, that the whole RED community needs to support. So I'd like to thank you and I'm going to turn this over to our Deputy Assistant Administrator um, Alexi Penahal, who is, uh, it, we're just very, very fortunate to have her with us this morning. She has been serving as Deputy Assistant Administrator since September of this year. She's been in that capacity before. Um, she's also been the Director of the Office of Infrastructure and Engineering. She's been uh, a Mission Director in USAID Ecuador. She has a wealth of experience. She also co-chaired the Gender Policy Task Team um, for the for the agency, and she also co-chaired co the state aid gender task force for the quadrennial development and Dip diplomacy and development review, or QDDR. So she's exceptionally qualified to talk about gender. Um, she also has great uh, academic qualifications, MPA from Harvard, and, and an MS in national security strategy from the War College. So thank you all, and welcome Alexi, and I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Diane did a great job summarizing the purposes of both the workshop and this forum, and I want to thank her for a very lucid presentation and summary. Um, Good morning to all of you. I guess I should have a soapbox because it's sort of hard for me to see. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, I can't see Cynthia at all in the front row. But um, uh, thanks uh, to all of you for your participation during the week and for your participation in this forum. I have to say that it's a real honor for me to be able to be here with all of you today to benefit from the presentations that you will be making 
and to um, benefit as well from the discussions that we'll have uh, both this morning and this afternoon. First and foremost, I want to applaud uh, FCMC and the or organizers within USAID of this, for this event. Um, I think one of the great uh, challenges in USAID is always to investigate and explore new ways of addressing um, some of those seemingly intractable problems that in the developing world. And the more that we're able to take a holistic approach to identifying how we can help our counterparts best address those problems, the more um, the more sustainable, the more and the more interesting our work is. And so the combination of looking at global climate change issues in conjunction with natural resource issues in conjunction with gender issues is the kind of holistic approach I think that makes um, makes our contribution sustainable and um, is certainly a reflection of the approach that the agency is taking now, um, a more holistic and hopefully coherent and sustainable approach to our development investments. Um, it's an uh, honor for me as well to um, uh, have the opportunity to introduce our Deputy Administrator, Don Steinberg. Um, Don joined USAID in September of 2010 but he's had an illustrious career uh, prior to joining USAID. He was a deputy president for policy with the International Crisis Group, and prior to that uh, appointment, he, was, he worked for three decades uh, with the State Department and in positions such as the ambassador to Angola, the director of the Department of State and USAID's Joint Policy Council. He was a special Haiti coordinator he was a Deputy White House Press Secretary, as well as uh, serving as Special Assistant for African Affairs to President Clinton on the National Security Council. He's also served uh, on the Hill <coughs> as Special Policy Advisor to then House Majority Leader Richard Gephardt. Um, I've had the pleasure of uh, interacting with Don on a number of occasions both in my capacity as co-chairperson of the Gender Policy Task Team as well as in my capacity as a, as a acting Deputy Assistant Administrator. And I can assure you that Don is a, truly a catalytic force in USAID. He brings to his work and his interactions with everybody a modesty that's commendable, uh, unparalleled experience in both dealing with the Hill uh, and dealing with the interagency process. Um, he provides us with um, insights that are both tangible and practical, and, uh, and uh, usually they work out uh, for everybody's benefit. Um, most importantly, I found him to be both a wise uh, mentor and a very compassionate person. Um, most people uh, also certainly recognize the fact that Don has been the champion for integrating gender uh, and renewing our commitment to integrating gender through all of the work at USAID. Uh, he most recently received an award from Interaction for uh, the Mildred Robbins Leet Award in 2011 for the advancement of women. And I have worked with Don in this capacity and I can assure you that uh, his, he's been an inspiration to all of us, and uh, his work and his legacy will live on uh, for time immemorial because what he's doing is ensuring that there are structures uh, within the agency that are created that will carry on our interest and commitment to integrating gender into all of the work that we do for time immemorial. Um, so without further ado, it's my honor and privilege to introduce to you our Deputy Administrator, Don Steinberg. sure if that was an introduction or a eulogy, <laughs> uh, but it is a reminder that it's always good to have someone whose efficiency report you write <laughs> introduce you in these settings. Uh, it is, it, it's really a great honor to be here today and a great honor to talk about the issues related to gender as they relate to climate change, and I did want to thank FCMC for hosting this. I am not afraid of acronyms. In fact, I have been accused of being an 
necronymphomaniac. <laughs> and uh, so you may hear a few of those in, in my presentation. Uh, I wanted to start out by saying that as we look at climate change and any other area that we're focusing on, we at USAID have put a new prioritization on gender issues. Uh, the most visible sign of that was the uh, appointment of a senior coordinator for gender equality and women's empowerment, uh, Carla Coppell. Another key sign was our decision to indeed put together a policy task team to develop an agency-wide strategy, one that have, frankly we haven't updated for about two and a half decades on these issues. But more importantly, there is an effort to instill gender into the DNA of our agency. And as we do that, we have essentially four pillars that we're approaching. And I want to go through these in general and then talk a little bit later about how they relate to the climate change agenda. First of all, we're committed to the empowerment of women from an economic, a social, and a political standpoint. And so that means in the political area doing uh, programs to support women's political caucuses around the world. Economics, it means not only focusing on micro enterprise but medium and large size enterprises and ensuring that women have capital, land tenure, and the other qualities that they need to succeed in the business community. From a social standpoint, it means things like uh, programs to ensure safe schools around the world so that young girls uh, in their teens can attend schools, not be afraid of sexual violence, not be afraid of having their period, not be afraid of going to school when they're pregnant. And then the key in the empowerment area is to taking these programs to scale writ large around the world. It's not enough to have 200 safe schools in Malawi. We need 200,000 safe schools around the world, and the key to that is partnerships, recognizing that we have a commitment, but we need to be working with the private sector, with NGOs, with local communities, with local governments, with international foundations. Every time I think about this, uh, I reflect on the fact that the single largest contributor to global health programs around the world is not the U.S. government, it is not the World Health Organization, it is the Gates Foundation. And we need to fully incorporate their efforts with what we're doing. Secondly is the pillar of what we call protection and participation. This area recognizes that women are most vulnerable when bad things happen, when conflicts occur, when droughts occur, when political upheaval occurs. And they do need to be protected in this environment. And so it means addressing issues of human trafficking. It means addressing issues of sexual violence. It means the whole 1325 UN Security Council Resolution 1325 agenda but it goes beyond victimhood. It, it has to recognize that women are not just victims, they are the key to solving these problems. And so it means empowerment in these areas. And one of the things I was delighted to announce just a few months ago at uh, Afad University, which is the women's university in Khartoum, was a new $14 million program to sponsor women's participation in peace processes and post-conflict reconstruction efforts around the world, providing them stipends, providing them training, and perhaps most importantly, providing them physical protection. Because the single most difficult and dangerous job in the world for a woman is a peacemaker. The third area is integration and mainstreaming. It's not enough to have specific programs that address women's issues. We need to ensure that all of the programs that we do are conscious of the gender dimension. We brought on uh, Karen Grohn, one of the world's great uh, gender economists, who is now working in our policy bureau. We've relied on <clears throat> the team that we've put together for our policy task team 
to highlight these issues. And so as we look at our Feed the Future strategy for, for global food security, as we look at our global health strategy, certainly as we look at climate change, as we look at democracy and governance, as we look at humanitarian assistance, as we look at economic growth, gender has to be a cross-cutting issue. And that means uh, that it's not just enough, for example, to have in a country a ministry of women's affairs, but the health minister has to be conscious of these issues, and the finance minister, and even the defense minister, right throughout the system. So as we look at why we're doing this, and we think about the relationship to climate change, what I think is, uh, I'm sorry, there is a fourth pillar, and that is walking the walk in-house, making sure that USAID is promoting women, is bringing mentorship, is looking at all of those invisible biases within our recruitment system, within our promotion system, within our assignment system, and making sure that there are no glass ceilings, making sure that there's full participation and that we ourselves are walking the walk in-house. So then applying this to the climate change area, I think what's m most important as a sort of chapeau is why we do this. And there are a few reasons. F first of all, it's the right thing to do. It is a question of gender rights. Uh, the right to participate in economic life, the right to participate throughout uh, the political and social environments. It's also a question, as I mentioned, of victimhood. Uh, women are most susceptible to the hard, uh, tragic effects of climate change. Uh, that is essentially because of the unfairness of land tenure systems, the lack of social inclusion, and poverty. And so what it means is that women more than others face the unintended consequences of efforts to reduce greenhouse gases uh, or adapt to climatic changes. But perhaps most importantly is because none of these programs will work without the full participation and knowledge of women. Women bring a ground truth to the efforts that we're under, undertaking they are key players in the management of natural resources at the community level all around the world. They have creative ideas. They have tremendous influence by virtue of their roles in their families and their communities. And they do bring unique perspectives to all the issues that we're, we're undertaking. And so we have an expression we use at USAID, which is nothing about them without them and it is essential that we apply it in this area. Turning directly to the climate change agenda, I've taken a few trips recently that have focused on these issues, and I wanted to, to talk about a couple of them just briefly. I just got back from Peru and Colombia, and there I was delighted to see the inclusion of women in our climatic change uh, adaptation and remediation efforts. Uh, we are working with the Mountain Institute uh, to empower communities and municipalities and NGOs who are dedicated to protecting the ecosystems, uh, essentially by regulating water uh, to make sure that there is inclusion and participation. And as we proceed with those programs, women are front and center. The women themselves have identified the priority of conserving the punyas, which are uh, the uh, water-based centers in those areas, and they are implementing programs to improve the collection of me uh, medicinal plants. They themselves have designed projects and are embarking on implementation programs uh, throughout Peru. Uh, we've also got a program to empower female counselors uh, who are the representative municipal authorities, and they have put together climate change networks all around uh, the affected areas. They're being trained to operate effectively not only as elected officials in those areas, 
but specifically on climate change issues. The training includes fostering dialogue with uh, rural women from the communities who are participating in the climate change training so that women's issues and the interests of women on the ground are reflected in all the adaptation and remediation efforts that are at play. Secondly, I'm also just returning from <clears throat> a visit to the Horn of Africa <clears throat> and where I And in the Horn of Africa, I had the opportunity to visit a number of the refugee camps where the Somalis have been coming across the border. And as you see what we're doing in that area, first of all, you have to remember that this is all a question of climate change. This is basically a drought that, because of political and military reasons, has turned into a famine. We have 750,000 people at risk of dying before the end of the year. It is essentially because the rain patterns, which used to be you know, a failure of the rains once every 10 years, is now a failure of the rains once every two years and may frankly be a failure of the rains period in this region as the climate does indeed change. And so we have literally hundreds of thousands of people coming across the border. How does this represent what we're trying to do? Well, one of the things that we're doing is introducing uh, new methods of cook stoves into the camps. Now, you ask, how is that related to climate change? Well, the reality is that women who are coming into these camps are then going out to collect firewood in the local community, engaging in deforestation. Bad environmental effects. Obviously, it is also bad because they are being subjected to sexual violence when they go out and collect the firewood. They're having to spend hours and hours doing that so they can't engage in livelihood projects or education projects for themselves. And let's not forget that 1.9 million people die each year from the effects of indoor cooking and indoor heating through uh, open fires, uh, through respiratory illnesses. So the introduction of 30,000 cook stoves in a pilot project into the Dadaab refugee camp is one response. But I think even more important than that has been our efforts at resiliency in local communities so that they're not uh, subjected to the worst impact of the drought and the famine. And so we have four million people who are affected in Ethiopia right now who are on international relief. But the last time this happened, we had 12 million people who were affected. And the difference is that we, working with the Ethiopian government and, and the people of Ethiopia, civil society, American NGOs, international NGOs, have put resiliency programs into effect. Things like introducing uh, drought-resistant seeds, uh, water catchment areas, uh, education programs. And as a result, 8 million people have not been impacted by this drought uh, and are still on their land, are still uh, contributing to their society. The third trip is one that I'm going to be taking shortly, and that's to Asia, where we're going to be indeed looking at the lower emissions in Asian forest programs. And in this area as well, as we look at where this program operates, which is Cambodia, Laos, Thailand, Vietnam, Papua New Guinea, and Malaysia, we're committed to strengthening the capacity of these countries to produce meaningful and sustainable reductions in greenhouse gases from the forestry land use sector. But we're taking this from a gender standpoint as well. We, we new, have a new office called GenDev in USAID and it's already conducting an assessment of the barriers and the opportunities for women's participation in the red sector in Asia. They're conducting uh, workshops to train our own teams and private sector and NGO teams in supporting red approaches on gender integration. 
We have a gender specialist who's part of the LEAF project uh, to integrate gender into all of those considerations. And we have a mindset, and that would be the way I would like to conclude. I mentioned that we have to have consideration of gender in the DNA of our agency, and we do. It has to be an issue that comes to people's minds not as a pet rock or something that they're going to do because the deputy administrator cares about the issue, but they have to fully understand that the programs that we're doing around the world are designed to be inclusive development programs. And what that means is that women, the LGBT community, disabled people, people who are displaced, indigenous populations, not only have to be the beneficiaries of our programs, but they have to be the implementers and they have to be the planners as well. We're seeking economic growth of 6 and 8 and 10 percent, but more important than the number is how that growth is distributed and how that growth is generated. And unless we're focusing on issues related to gender and the LGBT community and all of the other uh, uh, excluded groups who are involved in this effort, we're not going to succeed as an agency. And frankly, we're not going to succeed as a world to tr try to encourage development. So thank you again. Thank you very much, Don. I, I think he amply demonstrated uh, uh, that his breadth of understanding and the synergies that exist between components of our development portfolio need to be fully integrated. Um, the, the clarity of his vision provides um, the agency with um, a structural and systemic way forward, and uh, the consistency of his message regarding the absolute necessity of integrating gender has um, created a, a, um, a, a, um, an integrated, systemic, sustainable um, structure within the agency that we're pursuing. And I know that s many of you perhaps have been involved in working with us or providing comments on s strategies and policies. The agency is in the process of developing this new structural framework and um, all of us who are working on those strategies and policies are providing input to the other strategies and policies that are being developed um, with, a, with the expectation that we will be able to provide for both ourselves and our development partners both here in the United States and overseas a more coherent and consistent approach to how we collectively want to do our development work and that is in large part due to Don's leadership in um, establishing this framework for us. Let me now, um, so let me thank Don again for joining us today and, um, and as importantly, most importantly, providing um, the, the kind of passionate and, um, and uh, uh, passionate leadership within the agency, in particular on gender. Um, our next speaker is Jeanette Garon. She's a forester and gender development expert her career has focused on leading organizational change for gender equality within the agriculture and natural resource management field. She's the founder and director of Women Organizing for Change in Agriculture and Natural Resource Management, WOCAN. She has an MSc in forestry from the University of Washington and a PhD from the University of East Anglia in the UK with a focus on organizational development and change for gender equality. She leads the major group on women of the UN Forum on Forests and is a steering committee member of the Forest Dialogue. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Jeanette. Thank you so much for the introduction, and uh, I would just like to say how extremely pleased I am and honored to be uh, attending this workshop all week, which was really an experience. Um, 
and to be able to present the views of the workshop participants. But before I do so, I would like to say, Mr. Steinberg, um, you're a tough act to follow. And I've never said that before as a gender <laughs> advocate um, speaking in this kind of a room. So I feel tremendously inspired um, and hopeful um, about your, your words and what you're doing here at USAID. And I would like to say before, I mean, I have 10 minutes to deliver this, and certainly I'll be more or less reading out what's on the slides, which is a death by PowerPoint kind of experience for those of you who understand that. But uh, what's behind it is a real passion um, from my side individually. I mean, I've been working in this field for 25 years trying to convince donor agencies as policymakers and others within international NGOs of the need to start to take notice of the fact that women are primary actors of change within these fields. And it's been a slog, it's been an uphill battle. It's very difficult for us to check off any major accomplishments in this way. So this feels like a real turning point and it feels no doubt that USAID has the opportunity to play a role in global leadership. There's no competition, quite frankly. There's no one out there, um, and I say this very sincerely, uh, we've recently done analyses for USAID looking at gender within RED and, and payment for environmental services across Asia. We didn't find anything, whether with its bilateral agencies, multilateral agencies, or international NGOs. So the field is wide open, and I think um, it's very exciting, and, and I just can't stress that enough. With no further ado, I'd like to share some of the thoughts of, of the group uh, that was meeting and discussing this. This was a big component of this workshop this week. Some, many of these things uh, Mr. Seinberg's already commented on, but it's really true, uh, particularly within the forestry and environment uh, sectors. It's, it's just very rarely recognized that women are primary stakeholders. And when they are, it's as a vulnerable group. Um, sometimes those of us hear the word vulnerable and victim, victimhood kind of words and we get a bit, uh, we react negatively to that because too often when women are f put in this frame as vulnerable groups, it, it sort of allows a paternalistic kind of attitude that says we need to take care of this group of people and sometimes actions that follow from that framing of the term are not the best for women, but I, I think as you so rightly expressed it, there, there is a more susceptibility to the, to the negative impacts, but the need to understand that they're, they are actually part of the solution and primary uh, actors in that role. There's a lack of recognition of the, of the differentiated roles, rights and responsibilities and knowledge. Um, we often hear within the UNFCCC and other places of local communities and indigenous peoples, and there's a real reluctance to look beyond the term local community. So there seems to be this understanding that women are automatically included when we get down to a community level. That shows a real ignorance in all the work that's been done uh, across many years to look at the differentiated access to benefits that women have in these situations. Obviously, tenure is a real key component of this. Women own less than 2% of the world's lands. Um, and even within forest-related lands that are often controlled by governments, um, there's a real gap between um, what women can claim and what men have access to and control over. Um, this is true for both customary and statutory regimes, which we try to point out to our friends in the indigenous peoples groups that it's not always looking at customary law as something that's equitable and fair to all the members. There are limit, very limited capacities and opportunities for women to be participating in the consultations around RED in particular. This therefore limits their role in the decision making. Basically, we don't find women at the table. And the group this week talked about what is the table, where is the table, and why are women not there. And I think it points to a lot of biases held within the institutions that are in fact determining where the table is who gets to come to the table that have to be questioned. There are some cases, not very many that we know of to date, where, ren where gender has been effectively integrated throughout red strategies. I, th I think what you talked about, Peru, it, uh, makes us want to take a harder look at what's going on there. Um, there are other countries as well. We need to start to build the database of best practices and situations where it is working and why, and be able to bring the, uh, a certain focus and highlight to those. 
certainly there are limitations with the donor agencies themselves. And this has been frustrating because we know of countries that have themselves very strong gender policies, but somehow it does not carry through uh, into their development assistance programs uh, as well as right down to the project level. So, so you, again, your comments about how you build the internal in-house attitudes, DNA, and capacity to deal with this and enforce your policies is extremely welcome and important. Um, there's also just not very many champions for gender equality in red. Uh, we, have to, we can't help but look at the gender champions next to the indigenous people champions, and we're just so few in number. We're not, we've not been able to make a big enough uh, splash about this. We also could use some help in understanding how to better have the public outreach that gets us the kind of support we need. And also there's a big gap uh, between women's groups, women's rights groups, and those of us who work in agriculture, natural resource management, and RED. Um, the women's rights groups really don't know anything about RED or forestry or even agriculture. And, and the others on the other side don't know about uh, certain laws such as CEDA, which is a convention to end all discrimination against women uh, that was uh, been approved by 186 countries of the world, not the U.S., but never mind. This hey, is not Somalia either. <laughs> okay, there's two. <laughs> there are two. <laughs> there are two. <laughs> but never mind. There needs to be a glo at a global level, level a recognition of the rights of women that we, we don't see it coming through. Um, and of course, there's some really risk, big risk to women that when forests don't have very much of a value, women are able to access them for their livelihood needs without, in many cases, without too much problem. Not so in some countries where there's been such serious domestic violence and sexual violence. But of course, we're already seeing the impact when the forest land becomes more valuable, either for carbon sequestration or something else, women without the rights to that land very quickly get displaced from it, raising the question, where do they go for their fuel wood collection? How are they going to be able to manage their basic human needs uh, in this environment? We, maybe we're overly optimistic, I don't know, but we just cannot help but see that red with this new infusion of money, attention, and energy can bring some new opportunities to advance women's empowerment and gender equality. A view not shared by all that are working in all of the world of women's rights groups. Many of them see it as a, a market-based uh, initiative and therefore it it's brings dangers to women that we need to be aware of and cautious about. There are some good points in their argument. But we just see that this may be a chance to finally deal with some of these very thorny, difficult issues related to tenure land rights, which is, it's difficult. What's exciting to see now is that land tenure is no longer limited to land titling, but we're looking at the gray areas of, of bringing control to local people for that. Also, the very important stakeholder engagement and representation, again, women who are able to represent the issues of poor rural women is extremely important here. Benefit sharing, uh, again, bring them to the table. Let them be part of the discussions that go on about who gets what, uh, in term, whether it's co-benefits or cash payments from a carbon market. Employment and income generate enormous opportunities to think about how the green economy uh, now presents uh, new spaces for women. It provides an opportunity to take a landscape approach, which is also so welcome to groups like my own that are trying to work on food security and environmental conservation. And it, these are silos that exist in every institution around the world. And if we can start to bring those two so closely related sectors together, women who are forest managers are also the same women who are farming on the lands. So for them, it's rather artificial when those of us from the outside come in and want to talk about food security, but don't talk to us about environment or vice versa. It doesn't make sense. So this is a chance, I think, as well. And of course, we just see, as you've all said, that red as a, as a red plus as a mechanism can be so much improved and enhanced by the engagement and the benefit sharing with this very important group of stakeholders. These are all opportunities that we see. We've actually also tried to outline a few actions in the little bit of time we had. And again, we, we see that USAID needs to take the leadership. It's out there. I swear to you, it's on the table. No one else is coming forward. Take it. 
run with it. Use your commitment as such, an empower, as a, such a powerful donor and leader in the world to speak at every possible occasion. Bring the other donor agencies, multilaterals and bilaterals into this way of thinking. Support the development of pilot activities. We, we have some ideas, but we need to get boots on the ground, get down to national, subnational levels, try some of these ideas out, realize they're not all going to succeed. Allow us time to be failing and learning from failures to be fine-tuning our approaches for this. Some specific ideas came from mapping women's networks. We know there's women's groups all over the world managing agricultural resources, for example. Where are they? Wouldn't it be great if we knew where they were and we can start to, to uh, think about how to strengthen them, bring them together into networks to engage in these? Um, could we use a PAR here refers to participatory action research as a methodology for learning, for trying things out, learning, adjusting as we go, and then feeding those lessons up into policy. What we're hearing at the policy level is, okay, we're convinced, we're ready to do something in relation to women's empowerment, but what could we do? And there's the real dearth of creative ideas. I think your, your example of the cook stove is, is a good one, and particularly in a refugee camp, but what we're finding is that's the extent of the ideas, is cook stoves. And for those of us who've been around for 30 years, we did that, been there, done that in, in the 80s. Not a game changer. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got to think bigger. We have to think of the transformatory technologies that can change women's lives. I've seen it in biogas, for example. That's just one example. What are those big ideas, and how do we move those forward? There is a hunger, I think, now. There's an opening for those, those very specific ideas. Leadership of women has a big part to do in this? How do we build, how do we bring the capacity of these women's groups to negotiate on their own behalf, to come to the table, to know what to say, to understand what RED is? RED is so technical that even women at the very senior level really often don't have a clue and are feeling embarrassed to go sit at the table when they don't even have the technical language to sound intelligent on, on the issues. We've got to find this. It's not only local women. This is at all levels. Um, women's groups are key to building, to building capacity and to fostering the enabling environments at all levels. Um, we talked a lot about how flexibility and long-term funding are conditions that if USAID and other donors could provide would allow us that extra time to work with women. It's not so easy sometimes. We have to have the extra resources, extra time, and make mistakes. Please allow us to make mistakes and learn from those. Um, we've got to also develop the indicators that, again, they're related to gender equality, but they're also very aware of the risk that RED presents to these women, while, while seeing as well the opportunities for particularly the transformatory aspects of RED that could really make a difference. It's around land tenure and, and land control and benefit sharing. Also, let's get out of the silo approach. Let's look at all of the other work that USAID has done in particular related to education, reproductive health, uh, to design more holistic approaches. Does RED give us the opportunity and the funding to be able to do this? Let's look at the causal factors contributing to deforestation. Yes, women may be drivers of deforestation. What is the reason from that and how do we affect the causes rather than just the symptoms that, that we see at the surface? Recognize and strengthen the women's role in mitigating and mediating resource-related conflicts. We know they're coming. They're already happening. Um, let's bring women uh, and recognizing, again, perhaps women's, I don't want to say unique, but extra value as the sort of the stewards of not only the forest, but also the ones who stay at home when there's so much male out migration. Women are often left to do the conflict resolution. Let's build on USAID's, I think, some excellent work on that and continue that. And let's think about how we could potentially leverage support from corporate sectors and others to see how we can get carbon markets to work for women uh, and bring real, real, real benefits of the, the voluntary market, maybe the regulatory market as we move into that, that way, um, and to make it work for women. Right now, we don't see a lot of uh, things happening on that score, but mm -hmm. there's no reason why not. I believe the private sector could bring some really unique ways of working uh, in, in ways that work with women's groups. Thank you very much for the opportunity to share this with you.
I, well, I think we're going to do maybe a little Q and A. I hope it focuses on her and not me. Uh, but I, I wanted to just say a couple of things to begin with, and and one is that in my career and in my emphasis at USAID, I focused largely on the issues of women, peace, and security as opposed to these kinds of issues. But the lessons that come from that environment based upon your presentation are, are so clear to me. I mean, we need the exact same approach here. You think about peace processes around the world. One out of every 13 participants in a peace process is a woman. Uh, you think about all of the other factors that ex uh, engage uh, for the exclusion of women. They're very similar to what we're talking about here. And I think that some of the lessons that we've learned in that sector are directly applicable. I was mentioning the uh, $14 million program that we put together for women's participation in peace processes. Well, why not a similar program here? Uh, why, and, and let's, uh, in fact, in the, and I think it's a very similar phenomenon, women are peace builders at the local level throughout, you know, societies. Uh, I, I focus, for example, on the situation in northern Uganda where women in the Acholi population are the peacemakers. They are the deciders. And yet when a big negotiation goes on to end violence in northern Uganda, there's not a single woman at the table. And in fact, you have the weird phenomenon that Joseph Kony of the Lord's Resistance Army is actually representing the people of northern Uganda who he has been abusing throughout all that period. So one of the efforts that we're in doing is, in, in, and it's not an arrogance, it's not saying, you know, uneducated, stupid women need to be trained. It's exactly playing on the point that you raised, that these are tough negotiations. There, there are a lot of technical issues involved in peace processes, and they need to learn the language, they need to learn the skills, they need to build their personal confidence to participate fully. And then, I suspect that even in the uh, red area, that these are such sensitive issues when you're talking about, you know, who's, who owns the forest and who gets the land and, you know, land reform issues, that they do indeed need physical protection as well. Mm -hmm. So I want to I sort of ask you to delve in a little more on that area. Uh, as to some of the lessons we can learn. The other point that I thought was fascinating about what you were addressing is that it's so consistent with where we are trying to go as an agency. So you talked about science and technology and innovation. Those are keys to the future of USAID. We need to be a thought leader again. We need to be putting out the new you know, green revolution ideas, the new oral rehydration theory, uh, therapy issues, the new cook stoves issue. And we need help from you in, in the community to identify where those innovative and scientific and, and technological uh, answers are. Secondly, we're focused on partnerships, and this is what you were talking about as well. We've just had, this is actually USAID Public-Private Partnership Week, and we have 1,200 public-private partnerships we're engaged with involving corporations, NGOs, foreign governments, uh, international institutions, uh, all bringing special skills, recognizing, as we've said in the past, that no single agency has a monopoly on resources, on good ideas, on ground truth, or on moral authority. And I think this applies directly to what we're talking about here because, in fact, there are a number of corporations that would want to get involved in these exercises, not from the standpoint of corporate social responsibility or to some extent from that standpoint, but more importantly because it's good for business for them and they recognize the need for sustainability. I guess the final area that is so clear to me is that if you don't have local ownership and you don't have empowerment, uh, then it is the international community stepping in in an arrogant way to define the priorities and 
you know, none of these programs are going to be sustainable, and, and I think that's a, a key lesson that came from, uh, from what you were saying. And those are my comments. <laughs> so can we open this up for about, I guess we've got about 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, if you ask questions that are hard, they go over there. For me, I'd like true or false questions <laughs> or multiple choice. And if you ask multiple choice, you have to give me E, none of the above, as an option. Please, and please speak up and identify yourself, because we are streaming this live. From a gender perspective, this has been my experience and my observation. When we talk about gender roles, oftentimes we, and I wonder about this again, we propose to define them based on a certain cultural paradigm, which is not always consistent, particularly in an indigenous community. So I wonder, oftentimes, when we, when we do this discussion, are we Expressing this from a Western perspective, and how do we engage the counterparts culturally from the communities we're working in to make it truly representative of what they, what may be equality from their perspective? Why don't, don't we answer one them by one? one by one, and I have a brief comment after yours. Good. So much for the multiple choice <laughs> methodology. Um, thanks, Maxine. I, I think this is a question we're always working with. And, and uh, I, I think we also have to be careful not to characterize indigenous communities as necessarily gender equitable in our kind of a view. I mean, we, some of the points that came up this week were as well pointing to how that's not often the case. And I, I think it's always about breaking down the box. And I mean, we find gender analysis as, a, as an approach, the way that we deal with this. And I mean, I've lived in Asia for 25 years of my life um, where gender issues are, are very much part of the locally driven agenda and discussion. So <clears throat> my experience is that it is not so easy to characterize gender as something coming from the West. But I think the answer to this is to always start your project and your initiatives with a, an analysis of the existing situation, a gender analysis and a social analysis both. So I think we have the tools for that. And again, at USAID, I think you have very, very strong policy now to try to make sure that that happens. I just wanted to reflect on my absolutely first experience in development, which was when I was 22 years old and got sent to the Central African Republic and AID handed me $2 million and said, go start a rural health program in the Wam province. And I was completely unsuited to do that. But I went out and first thing we did was we went to the region. And we sat down with the men who were in the government offices, the provincial governor, the, uh, the mayors, and they said, we, we really don't have a serious health problem in this region. What we need is you to build us a $2 million office building that has air conditioning for <laughs> government officials. So we said, thank you. And then we went out to the marketplaces and we actually lived in the region for a week or 10 days. We stayed with Peace Corps volunteers. And we went to the marketplaces. We got people to sort of get used to us we sat under baobab trees, we talked with mostly women, and they said, look, this is a disaster. Our, our kids are dying from malaria. We have awful infant mortality <coughs> rates. We have uh, very serious problems with uh, vaccinations. And they spelled out what they wanted, and it was very clear. They wanted community health huts throughout the region where you could go and get basic treatment. They wanted training for midwives so that the births could occur well. And they wanted some 
addressing of the malaria problem. They didn't know exactly what they wanted, clearing out swamps, or we really weren't in the bed net uh, area then, but they sort of knew that that was a possibility, and they wanted some basic drugs to be put in. So that's what we did. Two years later, I left Central African Republic. We could already see noticeable declines in infant mortality, maternal mortality, et cetera. So for me, the answer is very simple. You ask them. You be guided by their priorities and their wisdom. You have to stay consistent to what you know is scientifically and technologically going to work, but you be guided by them. And again, the phrase, nothing about them without them. Just one observation on that, because um, one of the concerns that we have in the gender policy task team is how do we build into our, the way we do our business um, a mechanism that ensures that women have a voice. And so when we were looking at the project design guidelines that the agency was developing, one of the suggestions that we had was for the missions to establish a mechanism that allows potential beneficiaries to be able to speak uh, with their own voice directly to the missions on what they, what they want in terms of this project, what ben benefits they're looking for in terms of the project, um, so that we can avoid what, what are often some of the unintended consequences of, uh, of us doing our own analysis and then designing the project without, without really having an opportunity to hear their voice in an unfiltered manner. Thank you. Um, Ellen Shaw from the State Department. Um, I was interested to hear your comment, your optimism about RED as an opportunity to move forward on various development issues, including land tenure. And um, I'd really like to hear more of your thoughts on how policy tools and, and programs to do that, because of course, um, with, with RED and carbon markets, forests get vested with a value, that, a new value. And so who owns the forest becomes such a critical, it's really the fundamental question for a lot of, of local community, forest dependent communities, and especially for women who stand to be really negatively affected um, if things are done in, in a less than constructive way. So I'm just curious um, to hear, you know, we hear a lot of concern about this issue, but you've expressed optimism. Um, I'd like to hear <laughs> more about the source of that optimism and what you think can be done, you know, on a policy level and programmatically to, you know, to realize that optimistic view. Thanks. Okay. As you said, I get the hard ones, you get the easy ones. Okay. Um, good question. Um, I think one of the things we're talking about safeguards a lot. We hear a lot of discussion about safeguards. I think one of, you know, there's this do no harm principle. Um, one of the things is we have to see that do no harm, not paying attention to gender issues and women's uh, needs is already harmful. I think that's already something that most people are not thinking about. If you don't bring them to the table, they're a key stakeholder. By their absence and exclusion, you've already done harm and you've already widened the gap. So that's about taking a you know, sense of that responsibility. I, I think I just see that the, the you know, I'm, I come from the forestry community. I mean, we haven't had resources to talk about these issues even now. I mean, the who owns the, the forest has been a critical issue for a long, long time. But we didn't just have the world's attention on that anymore. So now we've got a huge attention on it, but you know, the train, like you said, the train has, I would say, almost left the station. We're not on it. So that's worrying, but um, we're, you know, it's up to us as the gender champions and, and the agencies who can keep putting this on the agenda. I, I still feel there's time um, if we do this in a concerted way with some real resources behind it. We've never had resources. That's why there's so few of us. The donor agencies around the world have just not given any attention to this issue over the years. I mean, we had our heyday in the early 80s, and it's been a steady downward slide since then. So I, I just feel that the time has come, and if we had one particular country and donor who would champion it, I, I have a feeling we could still, there's still time. Thank you. My uh, name is Miguel Leal, uh, Wildlife Conservation Society. 
uh, I work in East Africa and Central Africa. Um, as a RED um, project manager, I'm, I'm looking at deforestation drivers. And what I see in Central and East Africa is that there's population growth, forests being cut because people need agricultural fields. So I, my idea about gender issues is how can you empower women to have less children? Because that's uh, the main deforestation driver, what you see in Uganda and most of the other countries. So what's your uh, opinion about that? Thanks for that issue. We also talked about that this week. And we said, why has this issue gone off the table? Why is it so hot? politically that no one can even mention this population family planning. We put, we put it in the slide, to be very frank, under what we called reproductive health because that was the safe way of, of framing it, but agreed. A lot of women do, in fact, I think, desire that kind of uh, assistance. It does link to climate change. What could be more important and what could have a larger impact than that? So. 100% agreeing with you, and how? why is it so thorny to talk about? I'm still not entirely clear, but I agree. If we could start to get that back on the agenda, I think it's extremely important. For what it's worth, it is on the agenda at AID. We've had consistent funding over the last few years, even in the midst of the increasing politicization of issues. You know, it's always related to the question of abortion, which is, a very sensitive political issue, but we're not talking about abortion. We're talking about family planning here, and we are frankly proud of the record that we have in terms of increasing funding, expanding the use of certain kinds of drugs for that purpose, moving family planning into refugee settings, encouraging the uh, United Nations systems to more aggressively approach these issues, eliminating the Mexico City policy uh, and we haven't quite put a, you know, a, a spike in its heart, but for the time being we've kept it down. Uh, so I, yes, it is a politically sensitive area, but uh, you know, I know myself that I've spoken on this many, many times and I know my friends at the White House and the State Department have done the same. Please. Uh, should we take indigenous out of indigenous people so we can all equalize among ourselves and anyway we all are human beings. Thank you. I think we'll take that as a statement of fact and move on to the next question. Uh, uh, as I said in my commentary, the, the, it is essential that all the stakeholders in society benefit from the purposes of development, benefit from red opportunities, whether that is women, which is what we're talking about now, whether that's d the disabled community, the indigenous people, the LGBT community, absolutely. So I, I think the reason that we're probably not commenting is because it is, uh, is something that we all agree with very strongly. One, if you could please comment on what you perceive the main risks from red to women to be other than uh, you know, the land inclusion issue, obviously. And second, you also mentioned the delinking de between land tenure and land titling. Uh, if you could comment a little bit more and practically, you know, how that is being done and how it affects the gender perspective. Thank you. Okay, big one. Um, I, I think the risks are beyond the land is the immediate thing is, is like I said, the access to forest resources for subsistence-based and, and NTFP, uh, non-timber forest product, sales, which are in so many parts of the world in Africa uh, and, uh, and Africa and Asia and Latin America are really big part of women's life and families' livelihood strategies. So it's not only the, it's the access to those resources on which the whole family system and the whole farming system 
uh, depends. So it's, it, this is really fundamental. The delinking, I'm not really an expert about this. I'm only very pleased to say that I think USAID has been supporting a couple of initiatives on this, one of which was uh, making carbon rights, well, the carbon rights uh, project that is looking a lot more in, in detail at this. I think there's some other things that are in the pipeline that USAID is going to roll out. I think, again, USAID is perhaps taking a position of leadership in this area as well. So I don't have the details, but we could certainly point you to the right people to help you with that. The, uh, I'm not sure if there's anybody here from USAID who can talk about our Ecuador project, but it is one where we really are stepping forward in ensuring sequestration rights mm -hmm. for women in, uh, in that community. Uh, the other thing I wanted to, to comment on, and it derives from that question and, and frankly from Jeanette's challenge to us, is that there actually is a fifth pillar on gender empowerment at USAID, and that is the policy side. The fact that as we sit in you know, <laughs> deputies committee meetings or principals committee meetings, as we go to conferences like Busan or COP or Rio Plus 20, that USAID is a voice in the interagency and it is a voice in the international community for making sure that gender's on the table. And we, I don't believe we've probably done that adequately in the climate change area. And it is a mission that I will take back with me. Great. Please. Are we? Are we on to another Uh, in this country, it seems Can you identify that, yourself, oh, please? Uh, sorry, Dave Rabinowitz. Uh, in this country, it seems that empowerment programs have actually taken off when the people involved get start asserting themselves, start demanding their rights. The civil rights movement got started when Rosa Parks and sat down, and the students sat yeah. down. The gay rights movement started when the uh, gay gays in New York took on the police and all. And somehow, to get the women's rights going, women have to be educated and empowered. And one good way to do this is by modeling. And a good way to model is through en entertainment, like soap operas, films, things like that, on radio and or television. Is anybody working on something like that? Mm. It sounds uh, well, like a very high leverage, low cost approach. Depend, yeah, depending on what country you're thinking of and what access people have to those forms of entertainment and whatever, but I, I mean, I translate what you're saying into leadership and the need to invest in building leadership capacities. And part of that is also investing in networks because uh, my experience with women is they, they, they want to be involved in collective action and, and learning about other women's groups. And, and I think we, again, a, a new area for investment. Yes, the use of media for sure. Um, I haven't seen a lot of it haven't seen a lot of it, and not related to climate change very much at all. In the broader community, yes, but re with regard to climate change, I haven't seen it either. And so that's an important point we'll take back as well. I think we have maybe two more questions. So why don't we go here? I'm Melanie McDermott from Rutgers University, and I just wanted to pick up the thread of the earlier question and discussion basically about <clears throat> cultural relativism and gender, um, and just push it a little bit further to sort of acknowledge the fact that um, many cultures, our own included, have patriarchal structures such that um, if you're talking about local input, local control, community engagement, there's a direct tension between that and um, women's roles. So how, what are the mechanisms for ad addressing the fact that if you're, hand, if you're saying what is the local input, what are the local decision-making structures, local indigenous, uh, how do you address that direct tension with gender participation? Do you do that by sure. safeguard t ticking boxes, insisting on women's representation, and how to, you know, well, you know the question I'm sure. sort of approaching. <laughs> 
Yeah, absolutely. It's the big, it's the big thorny. It's difficult work in some places, but you know what? I mean, we were in Banda Aceh, for example, and it was a it was a USAID sponsored PES project that uh, been going on for three years, and the women had no idea about it, right? And we simply went there and called them together and got them to talk about it. And you know, sometimes it's just a result of somebody taking a an action that and doesn't just look the other way. It's not that it's necessarily so difficult. So that now we now found that the, the governor of Aceh wants to do all kinds of things. He wants to appoint women as the forest rangers and related. So it's, a, it's not always so difficult to bridge it. But if we as the development uh, initiators and, and implementers ourselves don't have this on our agenda, it's not going to happen on its own. And there are women all over the world who would, or I, I was in Afghanistan before the Taliban came and women and men would tell, oh, this is not an issue that has anything to do with women. Well, you talk to the women and they said, well, who is it? Whose culture is it? How is it that men get to define what culture is? And, you know, there's another voice and there's a, another side that we have mm -hmm. to create the space to listen to. I, I very strongly agree that Yes, there are differing cultural phenomena we have to deal with, but in many, many situations it is a foreign driver that can somehow change the dynamic. And every trip I take as U.S. Deputy Administrator, USA Deputy Administrator, the very first meeting I have is with women civil society leaders or women members of government, women participants in the political process. First meeting I have. And it is saying to others who look at my schedule and see me meeting with them before meeting with the president or before meeting with the big business owners, that this is the voice that I want to hear in that situation. And they get the message. And I always ask them, what messages do you want me to communicate to your president, who you probably haven't met with because he won't? meet with you or the business leaders or, or others. And it's a very powerful message. And frequently, I allow that meeting to go on a little bit too late, too long, so I can then tell the president, I'm very sorry I'm late for this meeting, but I was meeting with women who have very interesting voices, which I want to share with you. And it's a powerful message. So I think too frequently, we let this question of relativism bind our hands, but we also do have to remember that there has to be some sort of a prime mover in these societies to change the dynamic that is, is as you say, a terrible dynamic. Last question there. Oh, wait, oh, well, okay, we'll do two more because I'm not in the middle in the back. I. Um I noticed what you said about Identify yourself. I'm Carol Calker. I come from the Center mm -hmm. for International Forestry Research in um, Indonesia. And I've spent a lot of time in the forests of the world. And I've been kind of intrigued by the comments particularly about the importance of, of capacity building and training for capacity building. And also your comments about health because these are so intimately, so very, very important in this issue. Um, but one of the things that's really been a huge constraint for the women that I've dealt with in forests has been time. Mm -hmm. And I think without something like more attention to family planning, we're, they're not going to be able to liberate any enough of their time to be, to have themselves trained in capacity building or to uh, spend a lot of time on issues like red or, or improving health. So I would really uh, like to see a much closer link between the environmental mm -hmm. efforts, the red efforts, and uh, what you have very briefly referred to as reproductive health. <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> Agreed, and <laughs> the one thing I would add is, for example, in the women's empowerment in peace processes, a very important element mm -hmm. is the stipend that we give to women to participate in the process because very, very frequently they will come to us and say, hey, great, you've trained me, but who's taking care of my family while I'm af off in Abuja to negotiate this deal? And who's paying for my hotel room since the government won't pay for it? And who's you know, making sure that the school fees are paid? And who's cooking the food? And so we are providing them with the financial resources to be able to participate in that process. Uh, 
But on your point about family planning and all the rest, again, simply agreed. Hi, Andrea Thanos from the African Wildlife Foundation, formerly with IUCN, the International Union for Conservation Nature. Um, and I give that former because that's part of the context I'm speaking from. I used to participate in the international conferences of the parties for a number of global conventions. Um, and I say I used to because I've had two children and that is a barrier to actually continuing to be part of those delegations. So. A really simple suggestion, perhaps daycare facilities and feeding facilities at international convention conferences, the parties sure. and substas would be really helpful for yeah. young negotiators. That's great. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much. I think this has been a really stimulating uh, a series of talks, chats with us, and great questions from the audience. So thank you very much. Great, thank you. Just one um, final point, and that is, uh, for those of you who don't know, last night Don Steinberg um, dedicated a new uh, photo exhibits, exhibition. It's uh, in the floor, uh, in the mezzanine, basically just below, uh, in, in the same space as this auditorium. And it's a very informative, but also very moving uh, photo ex exhibition of uh, young girls from around the world and some of the challenges, uh, sometimes often tragic um, experiences that they've had. Um, but it's very inspiring because um, in almost every case um, they've, they've taken steps to overcome uh, these significant challenges and they're beautiful photos. So if you have a chance, um, do, do go down and see them. Um, so let me move on to our next speaker. Um, Um, I mentioned that Don Steinberg has been a catalyst for change in the agency, and I'm very privileged to um, introduce to all of you another catalyst for change, and that is Kit Patton. Um, Kit ha is serving as USAID's uh, lead for the President's Global Climate Change uh, Initiative, and she is the agency's Global Climate Change Coordinator. Um, in this capacity, she's been responsible for coordinating and ensuring the highest quality implementation of USAID's climate change activities. She acts as a liaison and a special envoy for climate change at the Department of State and other, and along with interagency, other interagency partners. She um, works very closely with the Hill in um, explaining to them what our climate change programs are and in negotiating budget issues with both, um, in, in both the interagency process as well as on the Hill. Um, we're delighted to have her with us today. She comes to USAID from the H. John Hines III Center for Science, Economics, and the Environment, where she was the Senior Science and Policy Fellow and Program Director. Before that, she was a Science Advisor to the Deputy Secretary of the Interior and Senior Fellow at the Center for American Progress. She's a former AAAS Congressional Fellow in the Office of Senator Joseph Lieberman and was legislative assistant in the office of Senator Dianne Feinstein. She's also the author of numerous scientific and policy articles on climate change. She received her PhD in ecology from the University of California, Davis, and I'm delighted to introduce to all of you my friend and colleague, Kit Dan. Thanks very much for that nice introduction, Alexi. It's a pleasure to be here this morning to talk with all of you um, about the government's Red Plus strategy, uh, USAID's programming in Red Plus, and how USAID uh, may address some key social dimensions of Red Plus. As Diane mentioned at the opening, the US government's Red Plus strategy is a government-wide strategy uh, released in November of 2010. It outlines how the United States will allocate and invest the $1 billion dedicated for Red Plus that President Obama committed to in um, Copenhagen in December of 2009. Um, 
And as Don mentioned, what we're talking about here at this conference is really about how we make this truly successful. This is not just about reducing greenhouse gas emissions, which is, of course, essentially important, um, but it's also about doing it in a way that's truly successful, equitable, fair, and um, as transparent and um, long-lasting as possible. The strategy was developed through an interagency process facilitated both by the White House National Security Council and the Council on Environmental Quality uh, to guide the budgetary decision making of this administration. Because Red Plus assistance is a whole of government program, the strategy helps ensure that all U.S. government agencies work towards common objectives. In addition, the Red Plus strategy has been distributed to USAID field programs around the world to help them guide program design. This U.S. government Red Plus strategy lays out a nested suite of global, national, and local activities for reducing greenhouse gas emissions from forests and increasing carbon removals through sequestration in forests. Uh, before I launch into a ta talking about each of those nested activities, I wanted just to mention um, a couple of personal experiences that are about the plus in Red Plus. Um, of, of course, not only is Red Plus about reducing greenhouse gas emissions, as I said before, but it's also about adaptation. It's also about communities, et cetera. I recently had the opportunity to travel to Ethiopia and Kenya, where I got to see um, not only the carbon benefits of investing in uh, reforestation, prevention of deforestation, but also adaptation benefits. These countries depend, of course, on, on water for many things. And I thought it was very telling that in uh, Kenya, they refer to watersheds that have been completely deforested and that they're now trying to reforest as water towers. Um, these are, it's a, it's a great concept I think that we should adopt here. I think that it shows a really good understanding of how um, truly healthy functioning ecosystems work, both in terms of the provision of natural resources, but also in terms of interactions with humans, between humans and the environment where they live. Um, I saw a lot of good examples of uh, women uh, taking a leadership role, just to link back to the session that we, um, we, t we just had. In terms of our partnership with TIST, I see that we have a TIST person in the audience, women taking a leadership role in, in training other women and men about how to access the carbon market by um, doing uh, planting activities. But also on the flip side, I saw a lot of um, work that was solely male dominated in terms of uh, really successful projects, reforesting watersheds, having tremendous impacts in, in carbon and also in retention of water and prevention of um, erosion, et cetera. But I didn't see a single woman who, woman who was participating, even though I'm sure that they were. So, this is all to say that we need to be having this nested approach um, in, a pr in our development strategy for investing in Red Plus. So at the global scale, there's support for an efficient, effective, and coordinated international Red Plus architecture to help countries achieve the Red Plus outcomes. The focus at this scale is to support the creation of a framework that drives policies and programs with evidence of impact by generating evaluating and analyzing outcomes, and providing coordinated, transparent, and effective financing and technical support to our partner countries. At the national and subnational scales, USAID is supporting Red Plus readiness to help countries participate in pay, per pay for performance programs and to take complementary domestic actions. Investments here will help countries become ready at the national level to undertake actions at a scale that can sig significantly reduce emissions or, inc or increase carbon sequestration, enable access for pay for performance financing, including future carbon markets, and meet ambitious domestic mitigation commitments. These readiness investments will help provide national red plus readiness to support a balanced portfolio um, of both the types of countries and regions where we're working. At local scales, USAID supports Red Plus pilot projects that can achieve or demonstrate scalable approaches to achieving significant cost-effective net emission reductions. To test and build the approaches identified through Red Plus readiness efforts, USAID has focused Red Plus demonstration investments in countries where governments have the political will and are also undertaking such efforts on their own. 
we focus our, our efforts on reducing emissions from forests and increasing sequestration in forests. Our country level investments in Red Plus aim to complement other efforts by other donors and actors in the field. Um, USAID's investments are meant to contribute to national level strategies and international and national learning on Red Plus. USAID is particularly focused on capacity building and creating enabling environments. That truly is one of our major strengths. This plays on our traditional strengths in these areas and also reflects the fact that while USAID's Red Plus funding in many countries is small compared to other donors, USAID can play a catalytic role in helping set the Red Plus larger agenda. Our Red Plus work is also part of our larger efforts to help developing countries reduce emissions while supporting economic growth. And in fact, this is part of our EC LEDs, which stands for Enhancing Capacity for Low Emissions Development Strategies, which is another US government-wide effort. Um, and it's, it's, it's all about economic growth and economic sustainability through investments in low carbon. There's a, there's a clean energy and energy efficiency component to this, but then also a sustainable forestry component. The, our U.S. government is supporting at the moment approximately 20 countries to develop low emissions development strategies, uh, which of course, just as uh, the deputy administrator mentioned, we need these to be country-owned and driven strategies, otherwise we're not going to get where we need to be. We work in partnership with host governments and other key stakeholders to develop politically endorsed strategies for meeting long-term climate mitigation goals. The, part, the, the, the purpose of EC-LEDs is to provide this targeted technical assistance that's necessary in order to achieve these long-term economic growth and mitigation objectives. Some of this targeted technical assistance is related to Red Plus, including measurement, monitoring, and verification of carbon uh, reduced and sequestered, rates of deforestation, leakage, and permanence. USAID is taking a leadership role in helping countries build their capacity to address these issues of MRV, or monitoring, reporting, and verification, as part of the US government Red Plus strategy. It should be noted, however, that the strategy also particularly emphasizes the, import the importance of social and environmental soundness, or SES, around Red Plus, and that USAID um, is, is funding work uh, on SES. The strategy notes the commitment of USAID to contribute more to social and environmental soundness, not only in its planning and implementation, but also in terms of the international Red Plus architecture and working with other Red Plus donors on these issues. Social and environmental soundness is, of course, essential for ensuring the success of any Red Plus initiative. It makes programmatic and not to mention financial um, sense. Thus, Red Plus programming will require putting in place the proper SES conditions. This, this, this objective harmonizes with USAID values because we are a development agency and our major focus overall is human well-being. Reducing deforestation and greenhouse gas emissions generally and helping countries and communities adapt to climate change impacts are critical but must be undertaken in ways to achieve both positive social and development outcomes. To this end, USAID brings to bear our wealth of experience on how development programs can improve natural resource management, especially forest management, while also enhancing livelihoods and governance. So focusing on the outputs of this week's expert workshop, there have been a wealth of ideas generated on how Red Plus can achieve greater effectiveness and positive outcomes through attention to social dimensions. Uh, the recommendations that we will hear from uh, our panelists in just a few minutes provide some innovative strategies and ideas to help USAID and other actors apply lessons and experiences, experiences learned in the Red Plus context. For instance, it was suggested that USAID could help countries where we work to inventory and assess outcomes of previous forestry and natural re resource management programs to guide strategic thinking on Red Plus. At the same time, new ideas were presented that fit, of course, well within USAID's comparative advantage. For example, Deputy Administrator Steinberg talked about the US government and USAID's leadership on gender and how this can and will be applied to climate change and Red Plus more specifically. Jeanette then presented a, a series of recommendations from the experts workshop on how USAID and other Red Plus actors can foster women's empowerment and equality. 
USAID's Global Climate Change Team and the Office of Gender Equality and Women's Empowerment are working collectively to assure that women's needs and priorities are advanced and that all programs identify and address gender issues. We believe that a gender approach will not only enhance development and human welfare outcomes, but that it will, of course, improve the effectiveness of Red Plus, as we've just heard. Specifically, USAID recently released a report analyzing the barriers and opportunities for women's participation in Red Plus in Asia, entitled Getting Red Plus Right for Women. This analysis is informing strategic investments to systematically integrate uh, gender into one of USAID's flagship Red Plus programs and to share these lessons more broadly with the Red Plus community. So gender is one key social dimension. The experts group has also tackled a range of other social issues that bear on Red Plus um, effectiveness and efficiency. Uh, the experts have also advised on actions that USAID and other Red Plus actors can take to enhance human rights and governance. Many of these fit within USAID's comparative advantage and areas of expertise as we support integrated systems to, to approach natural resource management that considers how ecological, social, and economic factors intersect over space and time. The agency understands the importance of a long-term capacity building focus in natural resource management, conservation, and global climate change. USAID has been an early champion of the landscape scale approach to conservation, uh, which maps land uses in ecologically important spaces to understand threats to biodiversity and to forests um, and opportunities for conservation. Of course, many of the activities that we are undertaking are cross-cutting that link natural resource management, governance, climate change, economic growth, and other issues like food security. USAID also has considerable and growing expertise in land tenure and property rights, which we just briefly discussed, including a new activity specifically focused on carbon rights as a, as a distinct new property right related, but not identical to, rights to trees and forests. A workshop yesterday presented the initial findings of case studies on how countries are approaching this new domain. Finally, when it comes to operationalizing social soundness and Red Plus, there's the depth of experience in USAID missions on particular country conditions um, and programs that allow us to work most effectively with policymakers and a variety of other actors in country. Michael Richards of Forest Trends and Zhao Ting Hao of the Forest Dialogue and Yale University will present a sample of key recommendations from the experts workshop. Many very rich ideas could not be included um, in this discussion for the interest of time, but will be, be, will be made publicly available in a report from this workshop. We see this workshop and this event as the beginning of a larger dialogue around these issues, one that we hope will contribute to efficient and equitable Red Plus work, and we look forward to continuing to engage with all of you. Uh, so we are looking forward to this, uh, to your questions and discussion. So, I'm going to uh, introduce both Michael and Zhao Ting uh, at once, and then we'll, we'll turn to Michael for his remarks to begin with. Michael Richards is a natural resources economist with over 30 years of research and development expertise in Africa, Latin America, and Asia. Currently based in the UK, he is now primarily working in support of the Katumba Group, a global forum on payments for ecosystem services in West and East Africa, and on the development of social impact assessment methods for multiple benefit carbon projects. He has worked extensively on policy, institutional and methodology issues around payments for ecosystem services, participatory forest management, and economic incentives for sustainable forest management. Michael holds a PhD from the University of Glamorgan in Wales and an MSc, Master of, is, is that social science, sorry? MSc? Master of Science. Master of Science, sorry. Um, in Agricultural Economics from the University of London. We use a different uh, uh, acronym here. <laughs> All right, so thank you. And so uh, Zhao Ting Hao received her Bachelor of Arts in Environmental Science and Accounting from Fudan University in China and her Master's in, the environmental management from, uh, in Environmental Management from Yale University. She has broad interests and a research background in a variety of sustainable development issues, ranging from industrial ecology and wetland conservation to the impact of climate change on developing countries. In between her studies, Zhao Ting has, helped, has held internships with local environmental organiz 
government agencies, NGOs, and business consulting companies in China. She's currently focused on red-related issues and heading the Forests and Climate Change Initiative at the Forest Dialogue. So we look forward to hearing from both of you. Um, Michael, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for that introduction. I'll try and live up to it. <laughs> I'm going to talk about the um, lessons or, or the findings of the workshop on enhancing effectiveness and efficiency. And I'm just really a rapporteur for the for the meeting. Now, how do I go down? This one, yeah. The basic message I think that I want to get over is the very strong uh, connection between social and carbon sustainability, that basically the, the carbon objectives depend on social s sustainability. Whether red plus works will ultimately depend on the, the de facto uh, actions of the resource users, who include about 1.6 billion people, poor people, who depend on forests. One authoritative analysis of this uh, concludes that local communities need to become active and willing partners to ensure the success of Red Plus activities. And perhaps this, uh, I think a lot of what we discussed in the week could be summarized in terms of, well, how do we get to this um, outcome of them becoming active and willing partners? An example of how carbon depends on social sustainability is is leakage or or um, carbon leak or displacement <coughs> of the carbon emissions from one area to another and this happens when programs or projects um, do not succeed in providing uh, sufficiently attractive livelihood options for um, local stakeholders to um, to switch to those options, and therefore the tendency is for them to move somewhere else and to continue resource degrading uh, options, which of course um, is where the displacement of carbon comes in. Some of the key issues, um, basically this is, if you like, the same theme that, that um, the failure to adequately address social issues leads to a reduced effectiveness and efficiency uh, in achieving red plus climate change objectives. In fact, one could, could say it more strongly that it's just not going to work unless the social issues are uh, effectively addressed. Um, we, if you look at the drivers of deforestation, the policy and governance failures that drive deforestation and degradation, it, it's clear that they have a very strong socio-political dimension, so it's common sense that the responses must also have a very strong socio-political dimension. I think there's also a realisation that what one might call Red Plus version 1 is rather stuck. In fact, there was a, a meeting last Wednesday in London, uh, Wednesday of last week, um, the RRI dialogue meeting, and there was a very strong agreement and including statements from the World Bank that, that they also felt that the, the, the current model, if you like, is struggling to get out of the station. And I think we, we observed that, that it has been rather technocentric in its approach to the issues. For example, treating social objectives as co-benefits or doing no harm. I mean, obviously there have been some very strong critiques of, of the, the red plus version one model questioned on effectiveness, efficiency, and of course, equity grounds. So this is a huge opportunity for us to help mold the red plus version two, if we can call it that. Um, so the first bullet point is, 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 is that we do have this, this, this great opportunity to, to introduce stronger social soundness or due social due diligence to the process. We have a lot of experience and evidence. We're not 
starting from scratch. This is a huge body of experience from community forestry, from trying to do integrated conservation development projects, from payments for ecosystem services uh, experiences more generally, which, which of course, Forest Trends is, is also synthesizing. And um, we, we, do, we do have a lot of lessons that can be brought out to help us see how we can work or, or support local communities and local stakeholders to achieve these, these required outcomes. Uh, and, of course, we discuss this throughout the week. Um, it is true that uh, this will require time, resources, money, but early investment to improve, for example, the social baselines, the social data, and, and we talked a lot about social mapping, for example, to enhance local capacity to participate, a whole raft of educational and training type things, develop appropriate methods. Some of them, we do have some good methods, some of them need to be adopt, adapted. Um, and strengthen the implementation of agreed standards and safeguards. This will, in fact, reduce in the long term the transaction costs and increase the efficiency and effectiveness. Um, some key challenges. Um, well, I've just mentioned the, fir the first one. Um, we need better data and analysis. Um, we need more effective monitoring. Um, I think there's an issue about what the international community would like to see happen, and we see this in the sort of safe quality of safeguards and standards, and what governments may choose or be able to do. Um, so we have to, there's always, of course, the sovereignty issues. It is unclear at this point how social criteria will shape the definition of when countries are deemed to be red ready. Um, there's also a question, an interesting question, whether a future red plus market could respond to a gold standard type approach, which is a kind of alternative to sort of trying to sort of um, prevent negative things. We encourage positive things through the possibility of higher payments if countries achieve higher standards. I think this is the last um, slide. So some of the, what are some of the things we can do um, or need to do that came out of the workshop? Synthesizing our long experience with participatory uh, natural resource management, including, of course, community forestry um, and payments for ecosystem services to identify what are the key lessons. We, we, we mustn't reinvent the wheel. We can tackle, or USAID in particular, can tackle the huge communications and awareness gaps that are needed in order, for example, that local communities become active and willing participants in the process. Um, we feel there's a big opportunity for developing a participatory and landscape level approach via integrated working or, or a group of m multiple stakeholders and, and also intersectoral stakeholders working together to develop integrated land use plans at the appropriate decentralized level. And, and this could be done in countries where there is already a strong decentralization process, so there will be political will behind this. Um, there's a lot of work to do in terms of raising the quality of social standards and safeguards, promoting harmon harmonization between these various systems, uh, improving the implementation of these standards and safeguards, including the quality of social auditing. Um, Joanna Durbin uh, we'll talk in the afternoon, I'm sure, about several of these issues. Um, and also about the, uh, the area of developing national social standards um, is, 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 is absolutely critical. And I think finally, um, we can promote participatory and, in fact, more cost-effective um, monitoring methods, which will also lead to the quality of social data. Thank you.
Thanks, Michael. As Michael's presentation pointed out, in, in order to actually enhance the efficiency and the effectiveness of RED+, Plus, we really need to consider the social dimensions. And uh, so the group also look at in a different lens on how we can structure RED+, Plus to enhance equity, democracy, and the government in order to deliver those social benefits Michael talked about. So some of the overarching issues that we talked about include how Red Plus can provide this opportunity to increase the recognition of human rights, equity, democracy, and good governance, and how we can use Red structure to build this monitoring and enforcement of those social dimensions. One key um, question come up is that how can we hold the government and those stakeholders involved in Red Plus accountable? And what type of recourse mechanism can we build at the different levels for this? We recognize that equity, democracy, and governance issues exist at all different levels, and it has its all levels has its own complexity in its political power. And we need to recognize the complexity and design Red Plus according to that. Um, specifically to rights, no carbon um, treating agreements can be dealt with without mentioning about the land treaty and the carbon rights. So how can we take RED as an opportunity to push ahead some of the land reform that we have been designing in the forestry sector? Um, it's really evident for us that the private sector need to be engaged in the RED Plus platform, not only for the sake of multi-stakeholder engagement, but also to ensure the long-term sustainability of financing the RED structure. So how can we take advantage of this new partnership, partnership, um, partnership forming around this RED discourse and uh, use that to enhance social equity and human rights? We talk about the intergeneration equity, equity between different groups with different capacity, and also the benefit distribution mechanism, both vertically and horizontally at all levels, how you can use those type of mechanism and deliver the effectiveness of RED. Um, we recognize to promote a democratic system around the Red Plus, you really need the knowledge to empower people. And for that, you need to create this two-way of information flow for from the local, between the local, the subnational, the national, all the way to the international level to make sure that there's a structure around Red that can encourage communication networking and promote information technology and information sharing. And those, how you then take those empowered people to be represented at a political level to make sure that the voice are heard in the decision-making process and to make sure that completing stakeholder interest and the power di dynamic between the decision-making can be balanced in those platforms. Uh, how we can use RAD to create this social capital and a local institute that can be always there for the people to build in those social issues. Um, again, just we do see that RAD creates some of the opportunities for us to tackle some of the issues mentioned above. Um, already RAD is creating this momentum at the climate change regime that we never seen before about the livelihood and rights of indigenous people and the local community, women and the poor. In Cancun last year, there was two side events on the agenda and the climate change, which hadn't been brought out, out through all these other schemes under climate change. And we, as Michael mentioned, that we are not reinventing the world. There's a considerable body of knowledge and the best practices, not only under the forestry sector, but also in a border development sector. Human rights are already protected in international conventions and the laws. Um, Jeanette mentioned the women convention, uh, the, w the rights about the women. Um, the international uh, also we have international law to protect indigenous peoples' rights, and the, some of a lot of the nations actually ratify those uh, international law and the conventions. 
how to operationalize those guidelines also are talked about under the Red Plus platform. The UN Red is considering and doing workshops on how to op operationalize those guidelines, and the UN Red countries actually are required to adhere to those guidelines. The private sector can bring positive influence on this because they care about doing good business. They want to mitigate their risk, and uh, more, more and more of them are actually socially responsible. Donors, including USAID, support the equity, democracy, and the governance, and they have a desire to avoid social conflict, and they want to do no harm. Technology development in this modern world is opening new windows for us to monitor red implementation at international scale, and also creating new venues for us to engage those stakeholders that was traditionally not engaged in the process. But we do see challenges in this, and some of them are actually already echoed in our discussion about gender. We still are not clear who and how to monitor and ensure accountability. This, uh, as we pointed out, there's a culture dynamics between um, the modern society and the traditionally society. So how can we make sure that we manage the, the local community's expectation correctly and be culturally sensitive so we do not increase social conflict? Corruption is the issue and it may hinder equitable benefit sharing schemes and how can we ensure good governance and address the corruption issue? Um, through all my work at the Forest Dialogue and uh, many of the countries that we talk to, there is a willingness at the national level want to engage more stakeholders. But with the lack of experience and lack of democratic society in those countries, it really is at a loss of how and who and when to engage those local stakeholders. There's a um, Strong, we, we really recognize there's a rights for indigenous people and there's a lot of talk about it, but how, how about the other marginalized group, include, including women? It is an interesting fact that the UN Red Africa guideline now actually includes local community. But as some of us know that it has been really controversial about this inclusion and broadening of FPIC guidelines. We also, um, although we know that this existing body of experience is how we repackage it and make it applicable to the Red Plus scheme. And uh, I think I'm not the only one here saying that I'm bombarded with all this information about Red Plus. And the quality of them really varies. So even with the modern technology, how we can ensure this access to information that's uh, really good and uh, correct and how we ensure we heard before using those modern media to ensure that the different stakeholders have the appropriate way to access those informations. Um, so we also talk about some of the concrete actions. Here I'm just giving you a snapshot. Um, I, I hope some of the, um, part, uh, the participants at the workshop can also jump in to give you more details. Um, but we, if, I, yeah, if I may steal the phrase that used by USAID, we really need to build the social components into DNA of Red Plus so we can address those issues at the very beginning. And that we do need social baseline data and the methodology to monitor those and to ensure that we are delivering that. And that includes not only the government, not the international structure, but also the private sector so the market can give rewards accordingly to those socially sound red project. Um, we need to empower people with the knowledge, not only for the local community to learn about the international laws and national laws that protect their rights, but also for the government officials to understand their there are obligations out there they need to adhere when they negotiate the red framework. Um, and uh, we definitely need better information and quantitative studies on decentralization and its relation with livelihood so we understand what type of structure and governance we want to build upon, uh, around Red Plus to deliver those social benefits most effectively. We know that there's existing multi-stakeholder platforms at international, national, sub-national level, but the quality of them and the decision power of these different platforms varies. So there is an opportunity for us to step in and try to enhance some of the existing platforms. As we heard from the USAID and also for some other donors, there's so many other development schemes out there that emphasize on social benefits, so how we can build synergy between those initiatives and making sure that we can enhance the social benefits with the, the, the works that we have already done in those countries. 
and uh, a lot of people ask why this time is different, how we can push a lot of these hard social questions in those countries that's not, uh, like as in the workshop, we term it not a low-hanging fruit. And uh, we really need to look beyond the red plus bubble and the seek alliance. Those may not be traditional alliance we used to build, but the, part, the red really helped us open a platform to map out the value chain of drivers of deforestation and degradation, including the demand side for the timber. So the power dynamic may ally in some of the non-traditional private sectors, and those private sector may really have the power to help us push ahead some of the transformational uh, governance issues that we want to see in those national structures for Red Plus. And uh, that's it. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you uh, both Michael and Zhao Ting. I think that you both presented on um, both the, the intricacies of how to be doing this uh, well and correctly and the questions still uh, that we need to be focusing on and then the opportunities um, associated with this focus on Red Plus and the opportunities associated for the social dimensions and, and, um, and really bringing the world's attention uh, to that through, through the discussions on Red Plus. There's one more thing that I just wanted to mention uh, in the context of the conversation that we're about to have, and that is um, the administrator of USAID, uh, Raj Shah, uh, has recently spoken on the importance of integrating democracy, rights, and governance into all three of the presidential initiatives, so uh, global climate change, feed the future, and global health. And so I think that this element of global climate change, to the Red Plus, is just one of those uh, points where USAID is very committed through this workshop, through the work that we're doing in programming, et cetera, to really exploring um, that link between DRG and global climate change. And so just as another element for discussion. So I think that we have... Forty-five minutes to talk and have a really rich discussion. So, um, look forward to gentlemen in the second row. Hi, I'm Michael Wallison with Climate Advisors, and I'm also the program director for the uh, Commission on Climate and Tropical Forests, which was which was co-chaired by Lincoln Chafee and John Podesta. And, and I bring that up for a reason. Uh, Kit, you mentioned the one billion dollar uh, red commitment. Uh, for the fast start period, which actually grew out of a recommendation from that bipartisan commission a number of years ago. And we are not on track to meet that commitment right now for the fiscal 10 to fiscal 12 period. Uh, we're actually looking like we're going to fall 200 to $300 uh, million dollars short uh, of that commitment, which, which I find very concerning uh, from a, a global, uh, a U.S. presidential global commitment uh, in, in the climate change arena. Um, and I bring that up uh, to, to, to think a little bit about solutions in the context of the conversation that we're having right now. Uh, and, and to do that, what I'd like to suggest is that we flip a little bit on, on its head one of the things that I keep hearing of uh, integrating SES into Red Plus or that, it's, that it has to become part of the DNA of the climate change uh, efforts. I think we actually need to flip that on its head and make the climate change efforts part of the DNA of everything else that's going on. Uh, in the context of a whole of government approach to addressing uh, climate change, we have to look at opportunities of the US, uh, elsewhere in the U.S. government uh, where we are engaging things like the Millennium Challenge Corporation Indonesia Compact, where we can integrate uh, Red Plus and climate change aims, greenhouse gas emission reduction goals, as not just co-benefits but as co-aims to other activities. So while the, the primary objectives there might be development goals and economic growth goals, uh, we've got to find ways uh, t to integrate what, what we need to do, much in the way that gender has been integrated into everything that we are doing elsewhere. So, so I'd like to, to cheer on your, your efforts at integration and really uh, use the gender example as a model in ways that we can incorporate uh, climate change goals and particularly red goals more broadly throughout the agency. Uh, and I'd welcome any comments on that. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Excellent points. Um, of course, we have yet to see what the 2012 budget will bring in terms of our contributions to Red Plus. Um, but yes, this is something that we are focused on as well. Um, it's very important to be fulfilling our commitment internationally. And so, 
something to continue to discuss as we move forward. Um, but in terms of the integration point, thank you very much for making that point. I think you're absolutely right. The, the way that USAID has integrated gender throughout our development portfolio, so it's a natural part of, uh, of our, our programming and planning from the get-go, is exactly what we're trying to do with, um, with climate change as well. And it makes sense for so many different reasons. If, if we're investing in food security, if we're not thinking about climate change impacts, then we may not make the best investments moving forward. Similarly with, uh, with global health, uh, if we're not thinking about how uh, rainfall patterns are changing, how um, uh, temperature regimes are changing, et cetera, we may not best understand how disease vectors are changing in their distribution, um, how uh, waterborne illnesses are changing in terms of their distribution, et cetera, and, ma and many other components. And so it's not just about adaptation to climate change through uh, both food security and global health, and then, of course, through the rest of our, our programming and democracy and governance in uh, gender, in water, et cetera, so many different areas to, to think about. But it's also recognizing opportunities to reduce greenhouse gas emissions whenever possible. And so, so we're not further contributing to the, to the problem of, um, of rising global temperatures and rising greenhouse gas emissions. So absolutely agree. Uh, thank you for highlighting that. That's something that we're focusing on. Um, in fact, uh, we just sent a request out to uh, missions for proposals for integration pilot projects to demonstrate um, the, the integration of both climate change adaptation and mitigation um, uh, concerns and outcomes with other top agency priorities, like the other two presidential initiatives, like democracy and governance, like economic growth, et cetera. So we'll look forward to using those pilot projects as an opportunity for the entire agency to learn from uh, er earlier, uh, we were talking about the opportunity to um, take chances and invest and, and maybe make mistakes, but to learn from that and also, of course, to learn from the positive outcomes. So we're looking, we're looking forward to the, to the launching of these pilots and to learning from them. So thank you. Any comments from anybody else? You've said it all. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Um, this gentleman right here in the brown jacket. Um, Miguel Leal from Wildlife Conservation Society. Um, I'm managing and developing a red project in Uganda, and I'm glad to hear that USAID is interested in red because I've been trying to get the mission in Kampala engaged in our project. We have a pilot project. It's a demonstration project within the red readiness uh, process of Uganda, and I, unfortunately I cannot get them interested. So I was wondering, is there another way of contacting uh, USAID or <laughs> <laughs> just to make this work? Because it's, it's, it's um, the other thing I wanted to, to say is that I'm, I'm looking at, uh, at a, a project, so feet on the ground and see what works in the field and doesn't work in the field. So one thing I already mentioned to effectively implement an, uh, a red project is uh, family planning. The other thing uh, we have to look at is uh, improving agricultural uh, practices, because uh, these uh, practices are not optimal. So uh, fields are already abandoned at a much earlier uh, stage if they weren't being um, uh, cultivated more um, better, let's say. And at the same time, by uh, putting money like in Feed the Future, uh, improving the agricultural practices, you also improve uh, the position of women and power women, because they are the ones who actually cultivate the fields. So I think it's, it's, it's by uh, already applying existing programs and making them uh, work t together, you create a, a synergy which will help uh, uh, empowering women, uh, reducing uh, emissions, and creating development in rural, uh, rural uh, areas. Thank you. Thanks. Again, the very important point about the need to be integrating climate change considerations across our development portfolio. Um, there are multiple ways to contact USAID. You just did it. Um, so we can, we can uh, I'll relay your, your message to the Africa Bureau and we can, we can talk about that. Um, we have had to make some, and I would have to check our, our, our budget uh, for FY11 with specific allocation in, uh, in FY11, no, there's, there's not. Okay, so we, un as, as we've uh, needed to do in, in this budget environment, we've needed to focus and concentrate our resources in particular countries, and so 
um, we may not have made an investment in Red Plus in Uganda for FY11. So that might be part of what you're facing, but we can follow up on that. Um, I suggest you talk to Martin Fowler, who is the Agricultural Advisor for USAID in Kampala, a very good friend of mine, and I've been trying to educate him about RED. So <laughs> great if you could follow that up. <laughs> oh, you did? Okay. <laughs> Gentlemen back here. Uh, my name is John Lewis, Terra Global Capital. We MRV red credits and sell them. And so I wanted to pick up, I wanted to do two things. I wanted to pick up on Xion Hu's point that uh, what's going to drive a lot of these policy uh, changes is not donor money. I, having been a donor for most of my life, I've tried it. It doesn't work. More policy change comes when, with peer pressure when you get more than one country together and they say, come on, guys, get real, come on. Uh, but she made a very important point in her list there that, and this is what we've experienced at Terra Global Capital, is the buyers are extremely concerned about these same issues um, because they reduce risk, not because they're ideologically committed to women's rights necessarily, but they want to buy a low-risk credit. And they know that if the women are stakeholders in that process and the poorer people and the landless, they know their credits will be lower risk. So her suggestion that those people be involved in the dialogue is a very good one, and this kind of meeting is a good place to start. You know, it's great to see so many familiar faces, but it'd be good to see some unfamiliar faces of Pacific Gas and Electric, one of our buyers, for example. Uh, it's not that they actually need to learn about it, they're just business people, and they're saying, you know, who's cutting the trees? And that gets to my real question, uh, we've had the agri from the same gentleman, we've had the agricultural question twice. And the first time he asked it, we heard about family planning programs. We still know that if all those family planning programs reach all their targets, we're still going to have 10 billion people on Earth. Agriculture is the biggest driver of deforestation. I used to be director of agriculture and food security at AID. And learning from those mistakes, um, better biotech annual crops you know, he talked about maize in Tanzania, big maize program, rice. We did a rain-fed rice program, which has led to the destruction of gazillion trees in West Africa. Um, we need to look at perennial food crops, what WWF calls the orphan crops. And they don't jump out at you in the agenda and feed the future. So in terms of doing climate change across the curriculum, or across the whole government approach, I really think we need to look at perennial food crops. I mean, uh, there's just no other, other way around it. And then agriculture doesn't have to be a driver of deforestation. It can, in fact, contribute to reforestation and contribute to buffer zone management. And, uh, and there are enough possibilities in perennial tree crop food producing species that they don't necessarily have to compromise biodiversity objectives either. So. Um, there's a comment and question. Thank you. Great. Do you want to follow up? Yeah. And um, just follow up on the private sector point. Uh, we at the Forest Dialogue is actually a multi-stakeholder platform. So the work we have been doing is engaging the private sector as well as the local community, NGOs, and the government in the Red Plus processes. And we had this really great example in Cambodia was actually implemented by Terra Global and the PAC that you see that the private sector come in and help the community understand what type of activities they can build around their substance and help them understand what kind of benefits you can get from Red Plus, not only from the carbon, but around all their livelihoods. So there's a misconception that we usually get from other countries that private sector is always the bad guys, but it may not really be that way. And they can, their perspective can bring positive change. And that point also come out really strongly in the workshops that we need to seek alliances. And I just want to actually go in more details about 
the value chain idea that we had in our workshop. The WWF colleagues here probably is another good one to talk about about this approach. That's the power dynamic on this globalized world is quite different from what we see before, and it's important some to look through the value chains and to really find those people that have power to influence on the other private sectors, to influence on the government. For example, if the we we had this um, for the we had this paper uh, looking at the value chain of timber and the drivers of deforestation, and the the Walmart and IKEA really have a strong role to play here. If they emphasize with their government, the government they're buying the timber from, that you need to look at the social dimensions. They're the good alliance in the red arena for us to bring in and engage them more fully on pushing the social dimensions of Red Plus. And I don't think we have done enough on that yet. Yes, I entirely agree as an agricultural economist. Um, we, we have to work more on agriculture. Um, Forest Trends um, is working with the commodity round tables um, to try and uh, raise the, the standards for, for oil palm developers um, and, and, and other sectors. Um, beef is another one. Because clearly there are huge uh, gains um, uh, which, which can have an immediate impact on the problem. Okay. Next question. Um, the lady right here in the white shirt. Hi, um, Becky Chaco from Conservation International. Um, I, first, I just want to thank you for holding this workshop. Obviously, these are really important issues. Um, and I apologize if I might not know as much as perhaps I should about the process, but I would like to hear more about what your plans are for integrating the results of the workshop into USAID's work and, and beyond USAID. How, you know, how, how can we integrate the results of this workshop into the actions that, that governments are taking that are trying to implement Red Plus? Um, how can we bring it to the international arena? Um, I mean, you talked a little bit about AIDS role in that. Um, and I think you know, we've used a lot the words safeguards and standards, but we haven't really talked about the difference between safeguards and standards and how do you really think about what's the minimum that needs to be done and then how do you actually bring the best practices into play? I mean, there's a lot of little booklets out there, but how do you actually disseminate the best practices and have them taken up? Um, and I think of the other issue that I didn't see come out as much um, is how do you do this effectively? I mean, it's a really huge issue that a lot of these processes cost money. And when you're talking about implementing Red Plus at a national scale, um, that's a lot of local stakeholders to be involved in a process. So how, how do you think about doing this in a way that can be efficient and allow um, Red Plus to move forward while still having the sustainability and, and, and being you know, a, a best practice of Red um, in a, in a way that's actually realistic for USAID to implement and for Ecuador to implement and for all of these other countries to implement. Okay, I've been tasked with <laughs> answering that question because I was one of the workshop organizers. Um, first of all, I don't know if you know, but f the Forest Carbon Markets and Communities Program is one of the major implementers is Conservation International. So. We've been working very, uh, very closely with CI on these issues, and in fact, supported some activities like the Alliance for Global Red Capacity Building, and you know other activities. And Joanna Durbin, who also sits in CI, will be talking about the uh, Climate, Community, and Biodiversity Alliance standards, you know, and how we can potentially support that process. So, um, we have we, one one of the things we try to do is work with you know, what's, what's happening already on the ground and how we can support that so we're not just coming in as a completely new uh, voice and actor. Um, in terms of the outputs of this workshop, as I had said in my opening remarks, um, we just had one day to synthesize them. 
So we have a lot more work to do to, you know, to understand the implications and where we can place the, the different messages and, you know, who needs to hear those messages. Um, the first thing we're going to be scrambling to do is to put together this side event for the Conference of Parties and, you know, assure that, that the message that we make there is something that, you know, uh, pe people that brings something new to the table and engages people, in, you know, in a creative way. So that, that's our task over the next couple of days. Um, we need to do outreach to missions. We had a couple of folks from missions there, but we really need to understand more what their needs are and how we can meet their needs. Some of what we did at this um, workshop will be integrated into the work plan for FCMC. So we'll have, be able to directly start investing through that, through the, through the resources that we have. Um, and then on the issue of efficiency, that's basically what we addressed during the whole workshop. And I'm sorry if that didn't come out, but we need to maybe refine the, um, the outputs more so that we can, the question we were asking is the social uh, dimensions. You know, yes, we understand that they're costly, but what are the costs of not addressing them over time? That's, and who pays? Yes, we understand who pays. You know, donors can p potentially cover some of those costs, but not indefinitely. So, you know, we have to think about other actors and, and, um, and other players taking on some of those costs, you know, over time. But it bears on the sustainability of the outcomes. And I said, we're, we're basing this on 25, 30 years of experience in the forestry and even in the ag sector. We know that if we don't do this work up front, it's just not going to be sustained. So yes, there's a lot of questions about who pays and how much and what are the trade-offs, but those are a lot of the questions that we're tackling. Hope that answers your question. <laughs> Anybody else want to? And if I just can add, like, uh, I think at least one action point that we identify is that we are not reinventing the wheel, and uh, we need to understand in those countries. I'm glad you brought up Ecuador because they have the social basket program that was built around this idea of enhancing livelihood and uh, working with the community, and uh, that in Ecuador become this platform that they can see how red fit into the picture, and uh, that's quite an effective way for donor to invest because the Ecuador government is highly uh, engaged in that, has been investing a lot in that platform. And uh, yeah, like just being, and there's many other examples in other countries that you can see some of the components that we need for RED has already been in integrated in some of their past national um, actions. And we just need to really identify them and understand how RED fit in instead of inventing the RED platform and then think how the other program can fit into that. Okay, um, all the way in the back, purple. Hi, I'm Connie Campbell from USAID Latin America um, Bureau. I have two quick comments and a question. Um, the first comment has to do with the, um, the comment that always gets a perennial chuckle that about having to educate donors and educate uh, particularly the agricultural officer in Uganda. Um, but I think it's equally important that our implementing partners um, uh, do their best to understand how USAID does or doesn't work. And it's my understanding that Feed the Future funds, Global Health Initiative funds, and Global Climate Change funds um, are, are not in the hands of every single country mission where we work. But that USAID has identified key countries where those funds would be dispersed through the internal budgeting process. And so there may or may not be opportunities um, in those three initiatives that we're talking about in every country. So again, it's important that as we're looking at these, these questions of flipping things on their heads, um, USAID may or may not have resources in certain countries for certain activities and then looking where what are their donors are doing and that's both USAID's responsibility as well as that of our many partners. Excuse me, many partners. Um, the second comment has to do with the temporal nature of many things that we've discussed both in the workshop and here today. In different sessions, I heard that the train has left the station, and then I also heard that the train is not able to leave the roundhouse because it's <laughs> we're still in version 1.0. So, and you know, I, I honestly don't understand all of these international policy processes and where they're halted or not. But um, the the comment that I want to make is that it seems. Um, without a doubt, but it's not as highlighted as I think it should be, the, the intergenerational nature of the, the, the stakeholders and the processes we're talking about, um, 
many comments have talked about getting women into the process and women are peace builders. We could run the risk of both romanticizing those processes but also putting a burden on a generation of women um, who have not had access to the education and the communication skills that, that they would need. And my comment is that if we don't now start working with um, the, the folks who are 12 to 18 years old now or working a generation and a half into the future, our investments, I think, would, will not be effective. And so I would encourage all of us to always be thinking about the youth aspect of that, everything from agricultural producers and whatnot. Um, and finally, my question has to do with some folks who um, traditionally have not been in the room, and I don't think they were in the workshop, and they're not here today, and that is the military. Um, we've talked about needing more resources, needing more information, access to information and technologies. Um, in an earlier USAID climate change training, we heard directly from a general, I don't know who it was, but um, it, it's my understanding that at least in the U.S., the Defense Department in many different aspects is fully aware of the impact on environmental security of climate change and have resources and programs directed towards that. And I would encourage us to, to think creatively about how we can tap into and ally with a sector that for some reasons may have not been a traditional partner in their sector, but I think there are resources as well as political pull that could be very useful and I'd appreciate your, your thoughts on that from the panel. Thank you. Thanks, Connie. Um, I think that, uh, well, I would like to, I know that we have relationships with the Department of Defense um, in within regions, and so I'm wondering if any of my colleagues who've been on the ground um, in terms of working on forestry have any uh, uh, stories to share with respect to how things have been working with partnering with the Department of Defense, or if you see opportunities for doing more of that. Certainly the uh, the, the point is very well taken. There's a large budget. There is the recognition of the um, of the consequences of, of not acting on Red Plus, not acting on global climate change, um, and the opportunities for doing uh, good work underneath that initiative within the Department of Defense. But I, um, is there anyone? In, Patrick, would you like to? Yeah, Patrick Smith with AIDS Climate Change Team. Um, it's, an, it's an intriguing idea. We actually um, were approached by some military folks who said, you know, we'd love to help you with your forest monitoring. Uh, we have satellites that go around, collect data, et cetera. Um, and we were very cautious about that and decided not to pursue that because of the, you know, the reputational issues that might come down of, of the military monitoring other countries and providing data on this issue. So. I think it's a, it's there's definitely assets there, but it's a very sensitive subject that we're and particularly if you're talking about sort of social the social side of things and social conflict, it's very sensitive. So, um, but uh, I don't know. I th I think we could think about creative, safe ways to do that. Yeah. Any other thoughts, Alexa? Yeah. I just want to add that I think one of the underlying themes of the week certainly for USAID and this conference as well, is that we need to uh, encourage ourselves to think out of the box, that there may be some partners in particular cultural or economic or political context that may prove to be very um, valuable and uh, long-term partners in our development process that we haven't engaged with before. Um, you know, we're, we're talking about the military immediately here, but um, it's clear from the 1,200 public-private partnerships that Don referenced that there's a lot of interest in the private sector and the foundations to work with us in, um, in new arenas. And so, of course, it depends on the context and, and the country in which we're working, but um, I've also found that um, in we tend to have this conversation about partnerships in terms of, you know, the global relationships, but in the countries where I've worked as well, I've found that it's been very valuable to identify local businesses 
um, some of whom may be subsidiaries of U.S. corporations, but some who are owned by private businesses. And they're, they're equally valid partners, and they're in country, so the relationship actually is more sustainable, and from my perspective at least, when I'm able to partner with a local cell phone company or a local, um, you know, Microsoft, for example, in, in the case of Ecuador. And um, so don't overlook those local partners either because um, they, they also have a vested interest in ensuring the sustainability of, of the resource space in these countries and, and the buy-in from local communities. So thank you. Uh, let's see. Um, lady here in the blue, I believe, jacket. I'm Carol Stoney from Winrock International. And I've been working on a... Uh, USAID-funded project um, on Red Plus, and we recently got our performance management plan approved. Yay! <laughs> and um, we were working on it for a long time, and uh, we had several indicators that were disaggregated by gender. We're looking at mostly beneficiaries, like income and and um, participation in training and those types of indicators. And USAID suggested we should have an indicator specifically on gender. And Winrock's worked a lot on building, um, on capacity building and, and increasing women's roles in leadership and in decision making. So we thought that would make sense and we had a component on capacity, institutional capacity building. So I looked through the long list of USAID standard indicators, but I couldn't find anything at all like that for any of the gender indicators. And so we, you know, we started asking around, is there a reason for that? And finally the word came back and said, no, there's no problem, you know, including a, an indicator focused on increasing women in roles of decision making and policy and planning. And so we did, we, we included it. But I'm just still kind of wondering why. Because I know, I mean, the indicators don't drive the programming, but um, the monitoring and evaluation can inform the programming. and. And especially if projects don't have to measure it, they're definitely, you know, resources are too tight to, to do something that you don't have to report on. So I was just wondering about that. Um, that's a really um, excellent observation and thanks for sharing your experience with us. Um, I think that the agency has been evolving in terms of its um, interest in gender, its degree of sophistication in how to assess our performance. And in the context of developing this new gender policy, uh, they recently revamped the entire indicator menu. And uh, we've come up with some standardized uh, gender indicators that will be introduced to the agency now. So you're just, you know, spearheading the effort. You're ahead of the game. <laughs> Next question, um, gentleman in the white shirt right there. Uh, Rodolfo Tello from IDB. I uh, was just wondering uh, about the uh, potential impacts on indigenous communities as a result of red projects and what has been done uh, or what are the next steps being considered to implement a follow-up system to uh, keep track of um, these uh, programs and how are they actually pro producing results at a more general level. Because when you uh, implement any sort of projects, they might have so, uh, mixed results, but then how to know uh, how well we're doing in some areas, what are there that we need to improve, and things like that. Are you, are you uh, Rodolfo, are you talking about specifically in terms of USAID? projects, USAID investments in Red Plus, and how we're addressing the issue of impacts on indigenous people, or more generally? Well, I, I think um, different countries have different um, policies that they use, particularly in Latin America and the Caribbean, and maybe Connie can speak more directly to that. but. Um, you know, missions have, have developed their own policies and their own, you know, sort of internal safeguards for how to work with, how to assure that indigenous populations are involved. I and mean, of course, we have a very strong record in that regard. Um, we don't necessarily have codified at the level of the agency 
you know, um, indigenous people safeguards. I wish Jim was still here because he, he worked on that for many, many years. It is something that we're considering. We have an internal working group that's, that's looking at that um, and together with uh, State Department. Um, but I know that individual mis missions have their own policies. I don't know, Connie, do you want to say something more about that in terms of the region? Um, just quickly, hi, hi Rodolfo. Um, yes, and in the absence of, and maybe, you know, USAID doesn't, uh, we have to question whether or not kind of a central policy is always the most effective way to, to address certain issues. Mm -hmm. um, in, in Peru, for example, the, the mission has an established um, policy that none of their funds will be programmed unless there's an indigenous, excuse me, an indigenous assessment along with a gender assessment and an economic feasibility. And so each mission is taking that into its own account because they um, are, I, th I think in many ways in the best position to know what some of those dynamics are in each country and what the national government, the host country government's policies and, and needs and, and assessments might be. Um, but we've been talking with the IDB and other donors and looking at other safeguard policies about that. And as Diane mentioned, there's both a central process, but I think importantly from the ground up, if you will, in each USAID field office or mission, there are increasingly either what we call a mission order or um, mission specific um, policies that appropriately seek to integrate gen or excuse me indigenous issues and needs and lastly let me just say that um, it was less than a year ago in December that President Obama and the US government in endorsed the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and together with State Department um, the US government is defining through its various agencies what that actually means in terms of implementation with um, with regard to indigenous rights Okay, let's see. The gentleman in the red tie here. Hi, my name is uh, Rezal Kusumat Maja from Starling Resources Indonesia. Uh, we've been working with a, a private Indonesian company uh, developing red projects since 2008. So this is private Indonesian company uh, in the 200,000 hectare uh, peat forest in central Kalimantan. And as the market became uh, elusive, uh, we started to look into, uh, you know, public-private partnership, working with donors to do uh, some of the work that, you know, still developing. For example, we are working with uh, Terra Global Capital actually in developing a beat methodology that is currently undergoing a PCS validation process. Um, to be honest, in when we look at the public-private partnership opportunity, we are not looking at the USAID because it's very complicated. <laughs> we don't know <laughs> what funds are available at the mission level or the bureaucratic process and all kinds of procedures that uh, we have to go through. So if we find this, we, we are a pretty well resourced organization, if we find this complicated, I can't imagine, you know, when we're talking about women's group, community groups, and so on. So my question to you is that, is there a plan, you know, in a spirit of thinking outside the box, uh, not afraid of making mistakes, is there a plan to have a, f a more flexible, you know, small grants mechanisms that, so that it can go directly to communities? Because that's where I find uh, very useful. Small grants uh, start to support uh, work on the ground, you know. Uh, you know, the private sector is, is fine. You know, we can find resources or new investments if needed and so on. But we're talking about communities on the ground who have to be on the forefront against other opportunities that are contributing to the deforestation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, that's an excellent question. And I think that um, Indonesia is a particularly good example of um, there are so many different donors engaged. Um, there are so many different components of the U.S. government that are engaged in Indonesia, um, let alone all the other uh, countries that are involved. And so I think that it, it can be quite confusing. I think part of the whole USAID Forward initiative that the administrator has launched has been in part to help um, break down the confusion around how USAID operates and make it easier to understand uh, funding opportunities within within country. I, I just was in Bangkok, um, I came back on Wednesday, 
and that we have a regional development mission for Asia uh, in Bangkok, and they were hosting a climate change coordination meeting. And one of the things that, um, that the regional mission is currently working on is providing a service to explain all the different funding streams that are available, not only from USAID, but also multilateral uh, funding streams, other uh, donor uh, funding streams within the Asia region, so of course including Indonesia, to make that more clear. And so that would be one opportunity is to connect with that mission um, and express your interest in, in that service that they're working on providing. Um, this lady in the brown has had her hand up uh, for a while. Hello, I'm Jenny Springer with World Wildlife Fund. I wanted to thank the, the panel presenters for the uh, very interesting summary of the workshop outcomes. And as an observation, I think one of the positive things we are seeing with Red Plus is that there has been a huge amount of international attention and mobilization of effort. And um, I agree very strongly with the points that it needs to be um, you know, more and better integrated, but including effort um, on some of the social dimensions um, that, that you presented. So I was wondering if as part of the workshop discussions there was any identification of um, you know, particular uh, lines of work on these social dimensions of, of Red Plus that USAID might have a, a particular niche or comparative advantage to address in, within this broader international context. Thank you. Folks who are in the Diana. panel discussions. <laughs> yeah, I was in Bangkok. All right, I, can, I can I can start on that. Uh, and Jenny, one of the uh, this came out in 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 the discussion throughout this morning. One that will resonate with you at WWF is this idea of the you know the landscape scale, and because we have a comparative advantage, we've been working in in that at that scale in conservation for many years. You know, so how do we, you know, in terms of you know lines of work, like where do we integrate that you know with what actors um you know it could be at the national level it could be something that um uh we do through our own programs you know just trying to bring bring those programs together um you know that was something that very very clearly came out um the other uh you know gender obviously was another very clear line of work if you will for you know i think there'll be a number of very specific actions tools steps um, we'll be working you know with the gen dev office to to really move that forward you know I, um, we, as i said we're already you know we're already uh investing in fcmc on uh uh red capacity building on this uh, sort of social assessment meta meta analysis i personally would like to see um that assessment, you know, the idea of assessment and social mapping, be developed as as a as a, as, an, as a comparative advantage for USAID, um, uh, and just elaborate that on that a little bit. The and I know it's expensive, and who's going to pay for it, and all of that. But um, you know, one one of the things we uh, looked at at the workshop was the fact if you don't do the social mapping up front, you don't know who is there. For example, people don't even know who is in the forest. There are many undocumented people. There are people who don't have tenure, you know, migrants, pastoralists. These people have a clear impact on any kind of outcomes. You know, who is going to do that work up front to identify who those people are? And then at a national level, you know, you hear voices, and maybe indigenous people or other people that say, yeah, we want our red project here. But then what about all the other areas? You know, what, uh, what do we know about those other areas? And how do we, you know, have a neutral sort of analysis of where there are potential areas and who is in those areas? And finally, you know, on this issue of drivers of deforestation, do we have really good neutral analyses of drivers of deforestation? You know, I heard a lot of hypotheses out there about, you know, ag agricultural expansion and all of that. Well. You know, I've worked in that field for 25 years, and a lot of it is received wisdom. I mean, there are a lot of areas that are, are d being d uh, depopulated, but yet they still have um, forest degradation. And so I think AID is a leader, you know, hopefully now, you know, wanting to be a leader in science and technology. This is the kind of research and these are the kinds of activities that we could move forward on. And those were a lot of the ideas that we shared in the workshop. 
The gentleman in the green. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Jan Willem de Bessen from IUCN and Wageningen University. Um, a lot of the issues that we are discussing have to do with the scope and the scale of Red Plus, the scope of um, what Red Plus can or cannot address, and in terms of how wide it can expand its its uh, the the interest and the issues that are included, and the scale at what level people are involved and to what extent at the local level, subnational levels, uh, different actors are involved. But there's also the time uh, aspect. And there's been talk about whether the train is still in the station or whether it is already left and close to reach. Now when you look at the time issue, of course the investment in Red Plus is important and that's where donor organizations come in place. They have money to, to invest in Red Plus. But the discourse at the, at the international level is developing. Red Plus has the different stages, the readiness phase. Right now there's an urgency to get people involved in readiness and preparatory uh, activities for Red Plus. Then there will be implementation and consolidation. So has there been discussion about this time pressure for getting things right before Red Plus is being implemented first? And secondly, how uh, the idea of a phased approach can also apply to future phases where, for example, climate smart agriculture, which is now the, the new kit on the block, can be incorporated in an overall land use change uh, mechanism. Well, I can, I can comment from uh, USAID's perspective, the needing to, to get the donor perspective in terms of the international negotiations to get that feedback. That's something that we're focusing on, and that's part of um, the presidential policy directive on, on, on development. And so we're, we're working very closely with State Department to make sure that uh, the development perspective is also engaged in the negotiations. I think that you know, we're, in, we're in a bit of a it's a difficult thing to say whether the train has left the station or not because we need to start acting because the, the evidence is here that we need to start acting now, but we also need to continue to work on making sure that we've got the right MRV, that we're addressing all the social dimensions that this workshop is focused on, et cetera. And so it's a bit of a, it's a, bit of a challenge to be doing all those things at, at, at once. And so um, I know that we're, we're actively engaged in trying to make sure that we're covering that while we're still moving forward. Um, and then from the climate smart agriculture side of things, that's also something that um, USAID has been very actively engaged on. In fact, we have a working group here who's focused on the intersection between climate change, natural resource management, and, um, and food security. Uh, so absolutely agree uh, that that is a critical component of, of, uh, of work uh, and, and something that we're actively exploring. Uh, someone else want to add anything from the internet? Patrick? Yeah. Is it on? Yeah. Um, yeah, I've been engaged in the negotiations for quite a few years. And one of the things about the, the U.S. position has consistently been um, that we should look beyond the forests and, and look at, at uh, sequestration and emissions across the landscape, including in agricultural areas. And it's nice to see that folks are, the rest of the world is starting to catch up to that perspective. We've always felt and this is something USAID has brought to the uh, U.S. position, that that was the only sustainable solution and that was the only way you would have the impact that was needed. Um, but it is a very slow process. I'm hoping that over the next year we will have maybe a workshop or something that looks at the broader drivers of deforestation. It's in the, uh, it's in the COP decisions that we should have such a workshop and that that would look at other land uses beyond forests. So. I would encourage those of you who care about this to talk to other countries and, and raise this as an issue so that we start building some momentum for a broader, more landscape approach in the negotiations, which I think you start talking about agriculture, you start getting into agricultural trade issues. It becomes very, very delicate. Right. But we think there are some win-wins there that, that uh, could be pursued. Thanks. Okay, we have time for one more question, and I think the person who's had their hand up the longest is the guy all the way in the back. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the pressure's on, I guess. Um, I'm Scott Bode. Um, 
I'm currently working as a consultant for uh, World Agroforestry Center, or ECRAF. Recently finished a three-year assignment um, working for Tetra Tech ARD on a USAID-funded project in Sierra Leone. We are promoting co-management. And prior to that, I worked for, as some of the people in the room may remember, EGAT um, within USAID for you know, nearly seven years. So I give you that little brief bio because there's two kind of terms that I've been thinking of in, in the context of Red Plus. Opportunity and then also um, a word that you know, for me, it was kind of a dirty word when I worked for aid, and that's attribution. So I can remember many nights coming home from the Ronald Reagan building, my wife asked how was the day, and I said, oh, another attribution exercise, blah, blah, blah. So <laughs> what, the point I'm making here is a lot of the work that we, we've done, CB and RM people, over the years, 20, 25 years, I hear all the, you know, propaganda or the talk coming out of the Red Plus stuff, which I'm not familiar with because I've been on the ground in Sierra Leone for three years. And I say that we're, we're doing this stuff. You know, we're, we're building better governance structures on the ground when we organize people in forest management committees, okay? We're, we're doing monitoring. We're doing all this stuff. So, you know, attribution wasn't fun, you know, when I worked for aid, but it was, it's a necessary thing. So we, we all need to talk about our work um, to capture the opportunity that Red Plus, I think, represents. It's an opportunity to support the good work that we've been doing, you know, for the last 20 to 25 years. So there's dangers. I'm skeptical about being so focused on carbon market and as opposed to other environmental services, but it's just another sort of supporting wind in the, in the direction that we're moving towards, you know, all these things we've been talking about. Equity, um, better environmental outcomes, and better livelihood outcomes. I think we can seize on that opportunity if we, if we play it right. But I hope that was worthy of the last comment. <laughs> uh, just one uh, quick reaction to that. Absolutely, we've been um, working in this field for a long time, and, and now, we're referring to what you, I think, would call attribution more in an integration component. Um, and of course, now for the first time since FY10, we have had we have direct funding for the three pillars of the Global Climate Change Initiative. And so we, we need to make sure that we're tracking those direct investments in clean energy, uh, sustainable forestry, and adaptation, as well as looking at opportunities to integrate those key components across our development portfolio. So yes, by no means is this 100% new in terms of the activities that USAID is doing, but there is a renewed focus on making sure that, especially with respect to monitoring and evaluation um, and really bringing the, the work that we're doing on climate change to the forefront um, are, are new ways that we're moving forward. So certainly learning from lessons that uh, that EGAD and other bureaus have learned um, and, and the missions have learned for many years, but uh, with a new renewed focus. I'd just like to add that I think um, uh, as somebody who's worked at AID for a pretty long time, I have to confess that I think as an agency, we have um, significantly underestimated the potential developmental impact that we may have had in the countries where we collectively have been working. Um, from my perspective, one of our um, real weaknesses has been that we tended to evaluate projects. So, you know, there was a phase when we did midterm evaluations and final evaluations. Well, all of us know that the, de the true development impacts are rarely uh, witnessed in a three or five year lifespan of the project. And um, we have overlooked, I think, the um, institutional memory that does reside in the agency uh, in, the, in, the, in the capacity of our Foreign Service nationals who remain in the countries where we've been working, in the capacity of many of our partners, like, um, like many of you in the audience, who have been working in these fields or in these countries for a number of years. And so I come away from this historical perspective, if you will, thinking that, that we've done all of uh, us, our counterparts in, in country, our implementing partners, and the agency uh, potentially a huge disservice because we've been 
really myopic in terms of when we expected the benefits to materialize from the investments, human as well as financial, that we've made. And so getting back to Kit's point, I think it's really, it, I think it's fundamentally important that we take a longer-term view of uh, when we expect the impacts of these projects to materialize, and in that context, be very holistic or integrated in, in our perspective because we all know that development is not a, you know, it doesn't, development doesn't occur just in, in a global climate change um, channel. It occurs in, a, in an education channel, a health channel, an economic growth channel, a global climate change uh, a component of the program. And our, our assessment of our, our, our collective success needs to also en embrace all of those components of development and not just be measuring uh, its effect in a particular sector. So the challenge for all of us is to think more holistically about uh, the development impacts that we anticipate uh, from a program when we initiate the program so that we have the baseline data that then demonstrates to some skeptical observers um, you know, that we really have uh, been a catalytic force in, in um, promoting these kinds of changes across the spectrum uh, that we all know development, uh, the development takes. So, thank you. Well, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll be the one to say thank you very much to Alexi for, for uh, coming in and doing your introductions and your interventions. And thank you very much to Kit for, for your uh, overview and for your wisdom and for staying with us, both of you staying with us all morning and participating and uh, listening to our panel and answering questions. We really appreciate your time. We know it's tight, and the fact that you were with us all morning is just fantastic. So let's give a round to our... And I'd like to also give a huge thanks to Jeanette, Michael, and Zhao Ting, who were up late I know because I was with, with, with them in one case, very late preparing these presentations. We only had one day. They, they volunteered their time. They care passionately about it. And um, it just enriches our work immeasurably to have these kinds of partnerships. Um, thank you to the uh, FCMC group and, and Natalie uh, for, for helping us to put together the workshop and the day-to-day. -day. It's not over. We have lunch for everybody. You're all welcome to stay for lunch. And then at 1.30, we will have Joanna Durbin talking about the results of, uh, <laughs> of, of, the wor of, a, of a workshop that actually went on this week on the, Red SC on the CCBA uh, SES standards and updating us on what's happening in standards in general, hel helping us to walk through the you know, the universe of standards and how they relate to each other and, you know, how we can understand and navigate that in, in relation to all the questions we were asking today. And then we'll have a lot more time for discussion and engagement and, you know, to, you know, to Jenny's point, how are we going to move forward on this? Not just USAID, but the whole community. So thank you again to everyone. <laughs>